For the past two weeks, my family and I have been traveling around various countries in Europe. Unfortunately, we had our passports stolen in Belgium and had to make a couple last minute changes to our plans, one of which included booking a hotel in a new city for one night. We stopped just for the night between trains in Cologne, Germany. I helped my parents find the last minute reservation online and it was a pretty standard apartment style rental. When we arrived at the rental, we were all impressed by the views of the nearby cathedral and church spires, the shingled roofs, just the general feel of history that the whole town had. We went out for dinner and came back after dark, all heading to bed for our early train the next morning. I shared a room with my little brother, and my parents slept in the next room over. I remember asking them if we could swap rooms, because I didn't like the layout of ours. There were way too many doors for me to feel comfortable. I have a weird thing where I don't like sleeping near doors, and I can't sleep in a room with any doors left open. Anyway, they said no, we could just stay in the original room, which had doors to the kitchen, hallway, and two closets. I was too tired to push it, and I figured my fatigue would override my personal habits, so I just got ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. While I was sleeping, I remember having some cycles of regular dreams. Then all of a sudden, I woke up within another dream. I was lying in the same bed, in the exact same room, and my little brother was lying in the same bed too. It felt exactly as though I had just woken up normally. Now I have very vivid dreams sometimes, but I've never dreamed about being in the exact room I'm in and I've never woken up to a dream within a dream. In this dream, I was sitting up in bed and so was my brother. I could feel that for some reason, we were both very scared and there was this charged and anxious feeling in the room. I remember my little brother saying, what is that? Get out your flashlight. At the same time, we were both looking at the far end of the room where it was darker and away from the windows. It was like we were both almost too scared to speak, but I could feel that we were both sensing whatever dark energy was at the end of the room. I started to fumble for my phone flashlight, just for some light, when all of a sudden this thing, the closest I can describe it as is a dark blob of energy, moved super quickly over next to my side of the bed. My brother and I screamed at the same time as this thing rushed up next to me. That's exactly when I woke up for real, at about 2.30 in the morning. My heart was racing, and I was sweating so hard, despite the room not being hot at all. I was so unsettled that I turned on all the lights in the room, and I didn't sleep for about two more hours, until I could finally somewhat relax, and drifted back to sleep finally. This experience was very disturbing for me. I never wake up early in the morning for no reason, as I usually sleep through the night, and I rarely, if ever, have nightmares. Like I said, I have vivid dreams, but they're usually not bad. I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a phenomenon like this, or if you know what it's called. Can people have paranormal encounters in their sleep while in certain spaces? Was I just having a really vivid nightmare? Or was that experience a signal that something bad was in that room? So when I was 20 and in the army, I was sent to my first duty station in Germany. The barracks we lived in were converted old five-story buildings that were supposedly once the headquarter buildings for the Nazi party. From what we were told, the basement of the building that I lived in had been converted into our armory. However, supposedly, it had once been filled with ovens and a gas chamber. Apparently, a lot of people died in that building. There were all kinds of underground tunnels below our caserne that had outbuildings on base. They were, of course, off-limits, but we snuck in some anyway. Aside from the underground tunnels, 
The building that we lived in was super creepy. I was on the very top floor. My friends and I would be in a room watching a movie, and doors would fling open. We all had strange experiences. I would get woken up regularly by something nudging me and calling my name. I would wake up and see figures in my room. I would hear footsteps in the attic above my room almost every night. It became normal for me. As I'm telling this story, I'm getting creeped out. Anyway, one night around two or three in the morning, I got woken up by a nudge, and I see all these lights on in the hallway from under my bedroom door. Then I hear tons of people walking in the hallway, like a crowd of people. I thought, what the heck? Are we having an alert? That's a random deployment readiness inspection that happens early in the morning. I thought maybe nobody told me. I threw on my uniform and opened the door. And it was completely dark. There wasn't a single light on and nobody was in the hallway. I thought I was going crazy. It's the weirdest thing that's happened to me. I really just stood there in shock. I had no idea what was going on. I went back to bed thinking I had completely lost my mind. I never told my friends because I thought I was losing it. I guess it can all be attributed to dreaming or sleepwalking or a half awake state. I mean, I know there's a reasonable explanation for everything, but honestly, in my heart, I know those barracks were haunted. Over the years, several friends and I have experienced an odd phenomenon while traveling around the state. We live in Michigan, by the way. On multiple occasions, we have inexplicably lost hours, and we've never been able to determine why. Sometimes I was alone, and other times a friend was with me. One of the most vivid instances, from approximately seven years ago, still unnerves me. Back then, I was living in Flint, Michigan, with my parents, about a year before relocating to Grand Haven. My friend and I decided to go camping in the Beulah, Frankfurt area, a journey that typically took between three to three and a half hours. We were no strangers to this route. We had made this trip numerous times over the years, especially since my family owned a lake house on Platte Lake, and we spent every summer there during my childhood. Wanting to maximize our time, we left Flint at three in the morning, hoping to get in some early morning fly fishing upon our arrival. Roughly two thirds of the way, on M115, just north of Cadillac, a peculiar calm enveloped the surroundings. Now, M115 runs through a national forest, so tranquility is the norm, but this calm was different. It was almost eerie. The early morning sun began to cast its first light, slowly illuminating the surroundings. Before we knew it, we were nearing the US 31 intersection in Benzonia. A glance at the car's clock showed 12 p.m., a detail my friend also observed. Doubting the car's clock, I checked my cell phone, which confirmed the time. Even a bank sign we passed displayed the same. The reality was hard to grasp. We had anticipated our arrival around 6 to 6.30 a.m., but here we were, six hours behind schedule. Fatigue wasn't to blame. I had had ample sleep the previous day, and with over 120,000 miles driven annually, I was accustomed to long hauls. Plus, both of us were well acquainted with the route. Our gas tank was still nearly full, indicating we hadn't just been driving aimlessly. Checking our credit card statements later, we found no gas charges during the missing hours. The truck's mileage aligned for the expected distance of our trip. What's most baffling is how seamless the time loss felt. 
We had no memory of any extended stops or detours. Our journey, by all accounts, felt typical in duration, but the clocks told a different story. I haven't recounted this tale in some time, so let me give you a bit of background. Between 2003 and 2005, while completing my college education, I worked the off-shift IT role at a historic federal building in Michigan that operated 24-7. This wasn't just any building. Dating back to the 1800s, it had served various purposes, such as a sanitarium and a hospital. The facility even had its own subterrain tunnels used for transporting supplies and, more eerily, bodies, reminiscent of train stations and old cemeteries. On my shift, I primarily worked in two areas, the call center and a secured communications room. The latter was situated in the building's sub-basement, which previously functioned as a morgue. Even though the comms room operated 24-7, with the lights always on, it perpetually felt as if unseen eyes were watching. The room's sensitive nature meant that no one could be in there alone. During the day, a minimum of three personnel occupied the room, while at night, on my shift, it was just two of us. One particular night, as I was engrossed in my homework, I heard a peculiar noise. It sounded like something heavy, being dragged on the opposite side of my cubicle wall. I beckoned my coworker, who also caught the unsettling sound. We wondered if any unscheduled work was going on, or if someone else was in our secured zone. But after checking, the answer was clear. It was just us. Every door was locked. No one had entered or left. Spooked, we took a brief break outside for our own sanity more than anything else. Oddities were not confined to the comms room. Many reported unsettling experiences in the restrooms, like an invisible hand tugging at their clothes. But perhaps the most unnerving part of my job was navigating the vast gothic structure in the darkness while updating computers. The security guards had a habit of turning off lights in unoccupied sections and I would invariably switch them back on during my rounds. Occasionally, as the lights flickered on, I would see fleeting shadows or hear soft murmurs emanating from seemingly nowhere. While the building bustled with life and noise during the day, masking its eerie history, nighttime was a different story. When it was just me and another colleague, every creak and whisper amplified our fears. For what it's worth, the building is still in use today. However, I've heard that many of those eerie sections are now merely storage spaces, inaccessible to most. I hope that sharing my experiences provided some insight, or at least a good story. I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned Oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same coworker shared another eerie tale. She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. 
It was a bustling Friday evening, with karaoke in full swing, making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old, condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening, like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, Did you hear that? about the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud, but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps, one saw the pans being thrown by nothing, and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. I was in Germany participating in a military exercise. Being an American, this was my first time in Europe, and also my first time in Germany. I loved being there, as I have a huge fascination with military history, especially World War II. This is important because it might have something to do with my unexplainable occurrence. We headed out to do some training. Our location was deep in the German countryside. There were some other military units out there training with us. Aside from them, any real civilization was miles away. At this particular point, we had been out for three days or so. We still had about a week to go, and we weren't expecting anything crazy to happen this early in the week. That's when we got attacked by the people who pretended to be the enemy. While most units received a direct attack, we did not. Tasked with providing communications to our artillery unit, our position was farther away. My best estimate is that we were at least two kilometers away from everybody else. To add to this, we were on top of a huge hill, so our radio signals could reach farther and be more effective. Regardless, we still needed to pull security to be safe. I happened to be the first one on guard shift that morning, so I grabbed our machine gun and headed out from our vehicle. As I mentioned, the hill was huge. As such, there was only one way to approach it, a tank trail. This trail went from the bottom of the hill all the way to the top where we were. The top of the hill was flat for the most part, but there was another smaller hill to the left of the road. To get to the bottom of the small hill, you would follow the road to the top and then go about 30 meters to your left. This small hill was the perfect spot to set up a machine gun nest, so that's where I put it. Based on the position, it was impossible to come up behind me. The hill was quite steep and was covered with heavy brush and dense trees. The foliage was so thick, in fact, that the only way to approach my position was from the direction I was looking. Fast forward 30 minutes or so, and the sun is just starting to rise through the trees. It was so quiet and peaceful, and I sat on guard enjoying the beauty of Germany when it happened. I heard a very distinct, hushed voice say, Hey, almost as if it was right next to me. 
It seemed like someone was trying to get my attention without making too much noise. The wind wasn't blowing. The birds weren't chirping. All I could hear was this whisper. I looked around to make sure that nobody had somehow been able to sneak up on me, but there wasn't a soul in sight. The rest of my squad was a good 100 meters away, in the vehicle, and I couldn't even hear them. It freaked me out, but I had no choice but to stay at my post. I tried to brush off the incident, but then my sergeant tried to sneak up on me a couple of hours later. I caught him, though. He hadn't realized how steep the hill was, nor how covered in brush. I heard him coming a mile away. He congratulated me for having my head on a swivel and doing the right thing. We started to talk, and that's when he told me a story that made my blood run cold. The area we were training in was a World War II battlefield. A lot of American soldiers from our sister unit had died around those parts. They'd had no artillery support, and the Germans were so well dug in they couldn't do anything about it. That information, combined with the World War II ammo cans and machine gun belts we found there, helped me put two and two together. I'm not sure what to think about this. I have no explanation for why I heard this voice. I believe in the supernatural, but I also believe in trying to find a logical explanation first. The thing is, nothing adds up. I wasn't tired, there was nobody around me, and there were no other sounds in the forest. Part of me believes that it was the spirit of a soldier from our sister troop, still fighting, hoping that I would help. But at the end of the day, the truth is, I don't know. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room, so then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly, Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink. As I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff, see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted, but I liked to pretend that it wasn't so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched Noises and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. 
We played video games, and he, in particular, loved to talk to me about his dreams, because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door, because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid, but simultaneously so tired that I just covered my face with my blanket. I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge. When he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what seemed to be a month, she passed away. And ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100. Stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were puzzled as heck, until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, 
even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends, and roommate especially, have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I've moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all, and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years and my friends introduced me about 10 years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high-pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped, and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m., when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end, we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees, looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. 
They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. When I was a child, around eight years old, I think I had an encounter. I say think, because after another experience I had later in life, it was highly probable. I lived in Lake Orion, Michigan then. The bedroom I slept in was not on the second floor, but it was higher up than the average. When you entered my house, you had to walk up three stairs to be on the main floor. So the windows were not ground level, like ordinary homes and we also had a basement. The window next to my bed was the same height as the others. Ordinary people couldn't look into the window standing on the ground. I would like to guess that it was way over six feet off the ground. One night, I woke up facing the window. My bed was pushed up right against it. It was a reasonably small room. I opened my eyes and my eyes were looking directly at an alien. Where we lived, there wasn't any light pollution, so it was very dark outside. But the way the moon was in the sky, it must have been full or close to it. It illuminated his head, which was entirely in view, and part of his neck. He had typical features of an alien, big black eyes, white grayish skin, and a small mouth. He had his hand resting on the window, with long, thin fingers, three long and the fourth shorter. At the time, I didn't quite process his height because I was a child. I couldn't really rationalize then. But as I grew older, I realized it had to have been very tall. I remember being very scared. I closed my eyes again, hoping it would think I didn't see it. I rolled away from the window and lay very still. I always told myself it wasn't real. I've only told a couple of close friends about it because it always sounded silly. But as I got older, I wanted to share my story. Some background. I grew up in northern Michigan, about 30 miles southwest of Traverse City. My grandparents also lived about five minutes from where I grew up, and they have a large acreage of woods, about 117 acres. Growing up, and still to this day, they have an old golf cart, and they've created long, sprawling trails in the woods. Somewhere in the middle of the acreage is a field about two acres, with an old sawmill. About seven years ago, when I was about 13, my sisters, nine and eight, and I decided to go on a golf cart ride through the woods on the trails. My nine-year-old sister sat up front with me, while the eight-year-old sat on the back on a mounted seat facing the opposite way. We drove up toward the field, and once we got through the trees into this area, I drove about a hundred feet in, and I saw this figure a ways ahead of me. It was probably ten feet tall, and was human-shaped. Its legs dragged as it walked, and it was hunched over, and its arms looked semi-detached and dangled. Its face was a gaping black hole, but I saw what I thought was a dangling eye. My nine-year-old sister caught it too and it began to run toward us. I whipped the cart around and sped home. 
My grandpa went out with a gun to the field and found nothing. I have been able to find nothing on this for years, and my sister and I are still terrified to this day. The only legend I know of from up here is a dog man, but it wasn't that. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything or experienced something similar. Maybe it was a skinwalker or a wendigo. I really don't know. Some friends and I recently visited an abandoned nursing home. We found all kinds of old cool stuff and it was really interesting walking around in there. We took a spirit box with us to see if we could get any interaction with ghosts. We were standing in a dark, empty room, put all our lights out, and turned on the spirit box. We made contact with multiple people. We asked them questions and they responded. I had never talked to ghosts before, so this was really special for me. There were a lot of voices. We kept talking to them until we heard a very loud bang from upstairs. We were startled, and our first reaction was to turn everything off and stay silent for a while. After some time, it was still quiet, so we moved on exploring the rest of the building, until later, again, we heard a very loud bang from upstairs. Again, we kept quiet and waited, but at this point, it began to get really scary. We went upstairs, and we saw this big blood splatter against the wall. At that point, we knew that maybe it was time to go, so we were slowly heading back. We got right in front of a big closed door that we wanted to exit through when we heard a loud noise from the other side of it. We ran as fast as we could to the nearest exit. We actually had to crawl through a hole in the wall to exit the building. As we were outside, we looked up to the floor where we had heard the noise coming from, and we saw something that looked like a shadow standing in the opening of a hole in the wall. It was hard to see since it was dark outside. Still, to this day, I'm very curious about what was behind that door, but maybe it's better that we never found out. Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As somebody who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There have been so many dreams about it, but a few stick in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door, and I see an arm dangling from the open attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't, because, obviously, but I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream, I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that this thing is threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive. I get my family out of there and go back to confront the thing. I see it for the first time in all the dreams that I've had. It was a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again, just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. Wrong. It slowly pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up. It grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and starts choking me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst, 
when it let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one, but I know it's been at least a year since I dreamt about it. I'm very uneasy around attics now, and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind. If this thing is not my subconscious, and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before. Just this. My hope is that either my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me and left me forever. I'm pretty sure my roommate's house is haunted, but they don't believe in ghosts or souls very much, so they don't think much of the weird things that happened around here. You can clearly hear footsteps in the attic. I used to live in an apartment, so you can definitely tell what different sounds you hear. With that, they are very distinctly the footsteps of someone pacing in the attic. There's only one way in or out of it in my roommate's room, so I know it isn't some squatter or something like that. Things in the house move around on their own, too. It happens in front of my friend and I a lot, to the point where we're kind of used to it. Even though we're used to it, though, I would be more at peace with it if I knew more about the spirits here. Any attempt to contact them has failed, so I assume they just don't want to talk. I haven't had any negative encounters with them, though, the worst I've had is probably knocking over some stuff on the couch. Still, I just want to know what I'm living with. Is that too much to ask? I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owns this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day. And then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze 
and it very quickly climbed this tall tree, and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave, and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110% because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive, because there was no movement. But then, it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy, and very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more, and then went to the next one, and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent, and its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us, as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up, and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse, and there would have been had it been raining, and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute, and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. 
When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time. So my family and I moved into a new house, which is a two by four house. It used to have an attic, but it's been sealed off. After a couple of months into living in this house, sometimes I would be watching TV and hear scratching from the roof. I just played it off as birds are very common where I live. After about three weeks, the scratching got worse and more frequent. It's like something's trying to scratch its way out of the roof. The attic entrance thing is above the outside of my sister's room. One day, my sister tells my dad that the seal is open. My dad gets confused because it was supposed to be sealed off. My dad goes to close it and realizes that it's really hard to open and close, so whatever opened it had to be strong. And that's when I started to get skeptical. The same night, I went to get some snacks from the fridge. I opened it to find out that they were gone. I figured that my siblings must have eaten them. In the morning, my parents are going on and on about a missing cake. That cake was supposed to be for my niece's birthday. They asked if I had anything to do with it, and I said no, along with my siblings. I was getting really suspicious about the attic. So one day, I built up the courage to go check it out. Note that I am probably the most paranoid person in the world, so I was scared for my life, but my curiosity got the best of me. I get the ladder, a torch, and a knife, just in case. I open the thing up, and I shine my torch to see nothing. But as I search more, I see the cake, empty snack packets, dirty clothes, and a short, dark silhouette that freezes in its spot. Immediately I bolt and scream for my parents and I tell them everything. They tell me to stay in my room. They go up and check, but he was gone. I am still shaken up about that moment and I get nightmares from it to this day. We've since moved from that house and haven't had any more issues like that and we live a normal, non-scary life, but I think that day will live with me forever. I've lived in the same house for a decade now. The old lady who used to live here died and her best friend still lives next door. I'm not sure how long she has left, but this house has always been spooky. It's always cold, it's really old, and I have had a lot of weird experiences for years. It's very common for me to hear footsteps, doors opening and closing, and my cat staring at random corners. My front door once opened and slammed closed by itself, and my mother saw an apparition of a Victorian lady in the front hallway in the middle of the night. I was also once home alone showering downstairs, and I heard somebody aggressively pacing back and forth in my room, opening and slamming my drawers closed. After a while, you get used to it, and you just accept the flow of things. For a while, the activity died down, and things seemed less scary. Plus, I moved away for university, 
so I got a huge break from the spooky stuff. But now I'm back, and the activity has spiked. A few nights ago, I was having a particularly hard mental health day. I was up at about 4 a.m., facing the wall, trying to sleep with my back to the door. My radio is always on at a low volume, and the music was playing. But I suddenly hear the voice of a woman behind me, almost groaning. It sounded like she was letting all the air out of her lungs, almost like wheezing. I freaked out, and when I looked, there was no one there. Yesterday, I was FaceTiming my boyfriend, and I heard footsteps in my house again, which I haven't heard in months. Distinct paces up the stairs, shuffling on the floorboards. I was genuinely scared, and even thought it was an actual intruder. But nobody was there. I'm scared that perhaps I'm manifesting something. I've never heard a woman before in this house, and the wheezing was so clear. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I'm scared of losing my sanity. And maybe I am. But my house has always been spooky, and this sudden spike has no real explanation. I'm going to try to smudge the house with some herbs that I gathered to feel a little bit safer. Hopefully, it works. So let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers, and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life ever for one second believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother, who has always sensed presences and been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons. Last night, though, Things changed for me, and it marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We've always had the same place we like to go whenever we want to camp with minimal effort. Our day started as normal as ever, but as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. When I asked what was wrong, he just shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving at about 12 to 1 in the morning. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which in the Middle Eastern culture where we live is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed in that at the time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now, my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First, he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then he spilled an entire bottle of coke on his phone. Then he dropped it into the sand and proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on. His elbow is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold and sharp right against his arm. He realized it was an unsheathed knife, which we packed with its case the previous night before. And later he said that it felt like something had pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively occurred within a matter of a few hours, which made us both uneasy, and I, for the life of me, could not figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser and they had a Nissan Altima, so we didn't expect to encounter as many issues as we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, it got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in sand. And the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. 
It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip. And later, my brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he really started to feel like an evil presence was around us. But he didn't want to say anything and ruin the trip and freak me out. We ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which again was much harder than it should have been. First, our tow strap broke off of their bumper. The tow strap cost $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. Then we almost got stuck ourselves in a 20 minute job that took more like 90, which again was extremely unusual. And with hindsight, just the beginning of all the crap to come. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark so fast that we had to scramble to build a fire to cook our dinner, before we were asked to help the couple. And I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. My brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat, and said with clear fear in his voice, that we should get going as quickly as possible, that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We are both Christian, so of course we thought it would help, but I think it accelerated everything that happened and just made whatever was there angry. We quickly finished our dinner and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine staying there, but I wanted to humor my brother but that's when I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave and I was quite taken aback by the feeling. So I voiced it to my brother and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace like we were just tired and wanted to go. And that's when we heard a sound very close to us on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big that I could only describe as the sound of death itself. It seemed to go on for several minutes, and when I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean it. I was about to have a heart attack right then and there. At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us, we turned on the car drove it back so we could see better with the headlamps, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. After the screaming, everything hit the fan. First, it was the sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us. Then it was the shadows behind the trees. I tried everything to get those shadows to change shape, walking around the trees and moving lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. You could really feel it too. We genuinely felt like we were not alone and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees. So they were not the ones snapping the twigs. At that moment, I was really hoping they were going to move so I could get us out of there safely, and thankfully, when we slowly started to reverse, they took a hint. But they looked absolutely terrified, and were just staring at the trees, too. It felt like whatever was there was getting closer. I've never felt anything like it. It was a gut feeling. It was just one of those natural instincts you can't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly, our tent was very close to the trees though, so that was a nerve-wracking experience. And while we were packing, it was still very silent. It's very normal for the birds around that area to continue making sounds until 2 or 3 in the morning. And at this point, it was about 8 p.m., so highly unusual. I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well. I know how they drive in the sand, and I know our car especially well, because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off and completely fighting against me. 
this fixed itself the second we were on the highway. The sounds of twigs snapping was still all around us, and it was loud enough to be heard over the sound of the car. On the path was what seemed like every bird in the area, just standing there and staring at us until we got close enough to force them to walk, not even fly, away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me and under no circumstances to look through his window. It was the tone of voice that told me to listen to him for the love of God. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway again, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota positioned behind a small dune and hidden by the trees, but was far enough from our campsite to easily rule out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw as we were closing to the exit was that we saw in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. A deer. I have only seen one deer in 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock. The deer was just not moving at all until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer and again my brother, with a grasp of my shoulder and a stern voice, said to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him later as we got onto the highway what it was that he kept seeing and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend, and they were all either pointing right at us or ahead of us. I'm glad he didn't tell me at the time because I probably would have crapped myself. We still hadn't encountered anyone, but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. And again, not the usual bird or cat, but big, unrelenting sounds. When I saw the exit, I was as happy as I have ever been. But that quickly faded when once again, we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. But this time, it didn't really look like a deer. It was more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer. And its eyes were milky. It looked rotten and horrible. I didn't much care. I just stepped on the gas and fortunately it got out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with that same tone of voice, said to go to the town. Later, he said once again that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us, so if we would have gone the other way, we probably wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away. And of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us, and most likely cause us harm. And that the way they get you into such rural places is to force you to stop and then do whatever they want, which makes sense as to why there were so many animals blocking our path. He also said that they caused bad luck and he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. Because he's my younger brother by three years, any time he had ever told me about this sort of thing before, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw last night. I can excuse the gut feeling as just being scared, but I cannot excuse the two deer we saw staring right at us, and I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out, as did the tone of my brother's voice. It's safe to say we're not going camping there again. 
And it's also safe to say that I will never dismiss my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again. I'm so thankful to God that he was there and that we made it home safely. Through my younger years, from about 7 to 12, my mother dated a guy very on and off, which I think mostly had to do with him being in the army and staying with his family in Laredo, Texas whenever he was home. Either way, he invited us to visit his cousin's summer cabin in Monterey, Mexico for a weekend, so we did. The cabin was very ranch style, longer in one dimension and shorter in the other so it was built like an architectural rectangle. On one far side of the building, think of this in an aerial view, was the kitchen, and next to it was the living room. Attached to the living room was a long, slender hallway connected to bedrooms on each side and a bathroom on one of the sides. The backyard was only accessible through the living room via a sliding door. And what started as a bit of the desert floor, met by a forest's tree line, although there weren't a lot of trees, mostly it was dead and dying Monterey cypress trees. Meeting the so-called tree line was an elevated hunting tower. Its platform met the top of the vertical tree line. On our way to the cabin, my mom's boyfriend was telling us about a cursed legend of the witches of Monterey. Apparently, they had been haunting the mountainous area for generations and were his childhood version of La Girona. Clearly, he was trying to scare us from the get-go, and me being so young, I was eating it up like candy. We got to the cabin in the late evening, so we decided to stay in for the night and watch M. Night Shyamalan's The Lady in the Water. After the movie, my mom's boyfriend asked me to go get something from the bedroom for him. And as I was halfway down the hallway, he turned the lights off on me. Let me remind you that this was a very rural part of Mexico. So the dark was dark. So with all the scary stories and the, at the time for me, scary movie, I was spooked, and I froze. My mom's boyfriend began to make your stereotypical ghost noises and taunted me to go deeper into the dark hallway. But I was so petrified, I remember just standing there, frozen in fear. Long story short, my mother got onto him and he turned the lights back on. They comforted me, and after a few apologies, we all went to bed. I can't remember how I slept that night, but I honestly wish I did. The next day, we did basic tourist things. Went to a bazaar, embraced the city's beautiful mountain range, which seemed to hug the city, ate authentic Mexican food, and visited the main hub of the city. When the day was all done, we decided to call it and went back to the cabin. What's strange is that I remember the night before so vividly, but I can't remember much about this night other than what I'm about to share with you. I was in the living room of the cabin, and I remember my mom's boyfriend was there with me. He asked if I wanted to go up into the hunting tower out back with him, and I said yes. I remember following him through the back door of the living room, and I remember him walking ahead and turning back to wave me toward him. I thought he was just trying to help me keep up with him, so I followed him. I watched him climb up the ladder of the hunting tower, and then I heard a voice behind me. Hey, where are you going? I turned around. It was my mom's boyfriend behind me, asking where I was going. I didn't know how to say, I was following you. I turned back around to look at the hunting tower along the tree line, and nobody was there. Nothing was. Not an animal, not my mother, not a ghost. Nothing. 
Fast forward to a few years ago, my now wife and I were still dating at the time and sharing ghost experiences with one another. I told her about this experience and Monterey, and I'll never forget the look on her face when I told her. She is from a Mexican family as well, and this legend of the witches of Monterey is a very real thing for her as well. The scary part? I was telling her this story on a Friday, and according to what her family told her growing up, Friday is a forbidden day to talk about them, because that's one day of the week that they're most powerful. Apparently, they never forget their prey, and they use that day as a lure toward what was lost. Initially, I thought, that's BS. But I can't begin to express how many Fridays my wife had to stop me because I would randomly bring up the story. Maybe it was just self-conscious, I don't know. But it still kind of freaks me out to this day. This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before, and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after staring at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around, just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me, wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but why was she staring at me like that? Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off, and she was gone. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie that my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, but mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Anyway, we were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped and giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the world it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is Kat's mom, which I figured out earlier in the day was also just a tad creepy. Do you think it's just your mom? I asked, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again, but this time she said something that gave me the chills and still does. She said, my mom isn't home. It's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. No, she's at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. I said, if your mom is at work, then who was that lady staring at me earlier? 
As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time. But thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot, above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Cat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again, until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling, and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I looked over at her, and I could see true fear on her face. The footsteps stopped, and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old, and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no siblings. We were completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house. I grabbed her and ran out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than we would in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back into reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them all in the attic. And then she hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty, and no one found them for months afterwards in this house. My heart started to pound, my eyes wide with fear, and I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day, but I've never seen the lady. But you have, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like knots. I felt as though I had walked into a horror movie, and I just wished the day had never happened. Fast forward years later, that was the last day I had ever seen or heard from Kat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. But why not her? I think her scary story might have had some flaws, but I still wonder what happened in that house. I've driven by there maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe she was one of the ones that never made it out. My parents live in a community in the desert of southwestern United States. After graduating college, I spent some time living at their house, going through the misery of unemployment and applying for jobs. Being away from the city, their neighborhood can get really dark at night, especially when there are clouds or the moon isn't out. This neighborhood has had some issues with the paranormal. People have posted on the Facebook community page, asking if anyone has had strange experiences, with the comments on the posts always blowing up, with people sharing encounters. Dogs barking and growling at entities not visible in the house, silverware and dishes going missing over time, only to later find it mysteriously in the attic, shadow figures, things like that. One late night, I was alone at their house, watching television. My parents were gone on vacation back east. My parents have this odd cat 
who is the living definition of a scary cat. Even though it enjoys going outside, the cat won't go unless you're out there with it. If you go back inside, the cat will immediately be cowering in the windows, begging to be let in. As I was watching television, the cat comes darting past my feet to the sliding glass door that opens to the backyard. She was in that low, sneaking position the cats get in when they see something they want to hunt or pounce on. She was frozen, fixated, on something in the back corner of the yard. Out of curiosity of what the cat was seeing, I opened the sliding glass door and let her out. She immediately runs up to the bushes in the corner of the yard and stops, still in the low sneaking position. I walked outside, wondering what in the world was going on. This was one of those dark nights with no moon in the sky, making it difficult to see anything except the outline of the bushes. Suddenly, an orb of bright yellow light flies out of the bushes about the size of a softball. The orb goes up and over the cinder block wall into the neighbor's yard. Both the cat and I jump out of fright. I run back inside, being filled with the familiar dreaded feeling of being around something paranormal. Collecting my courage, I grab a flashlight and I go back out to see if anything's there and to find the cat. I go back to the corner of the backyard and I see nothing in the bushes where the orb had come out of. I search the whole yard and I can't find the cat, who was also too little to jump the cinder block walls. The whole time I was outside again just felt wrong, like I shouldn't be there. I went back inside and waited a couple of hours until the cat finally showed up in the windowsill in a state of panic. I knew that I saw something with this experience because it was this little weird cat who brought it to my attention. A few days later, my parents are back from their vacation and I tell them about my weird experience. This kind of freaked my mom out, who has read the community Facebook posts about the neighborhood having paranormal activity. Going to bed, I suddenly see a bunch of police cars show up outside the neighbor's house and our house. Police are getting out with their guns drawn. I alert my parents and we lurk in the windows wondering what in the world is happening. I see the next door neighbor girl outside, talking to the police. Nothing really happened except the police searched her house. The next day, my dad calls our neighbor asking if everything was okay and if they could help. Apparently, their daughter was home alone while they were away. She was walking in the hallway when she saw a black shadowy figure in the house at the end of the hall. She screamed and ran for her phone and called the police. The police searched the house and the surrounding area, but found nobody and didn't find any evidence of a break-in. It was the neighbor's house their bushes, actually, that the orb had flown out of a few nights prior. My husband and I met a guy who used to work in our house. In conversation one day, he said, so have you met the ghosts yet? My husband started laughing and said, we sure have. We were a little bit skeptical as to whether we'd imagined the things that happened, but laborers working here have been very unsettled by some events, and in some cases they've refused to come back. We've always lived in houses where strange things happen, but this one has really been a wild ride. It's very haunted. Noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices, shadows, it's crazy. He also told us some of the things that happened here. It's a very old house, and in recent years it was a home for addicts with new babies. 
A lot of serious, horrific trauma happened here. I cried when he told us about it. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the energy here is so charged. Knowing this, I thought that over the weekend I might light some candles and sage the house, and invite anything to leave that needs to go, though I suppose some will probably want to stay. I'd be interested to know what you would do here. Our family and friends have said to move out, but we like it here. We don't have any bad experiences, really. We're not frightened. And, as far as advice goes, I don't really want any advice on exorcisms or fleeing the house. The worst thing we've ever experienced was a disembodied groaning noise. It was very human and very strange. But if it was intended to frighten us, it didn't. I raised my eyebrows at my husband and then carried on working. Last night, my husband and I opened doors and windows all throughout the house. We started in the cellar and worked our way up through the house. There are 28 rooms or spaces, so it took us ages. I used white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each to carry the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones and sentimental to us. As we moved through the house, I just talked, asking any spirits who didn't respect us or wanted to harm us to leave our house, that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate it and that if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they had to respect us and treat us with kindness and we would do the same. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic house history. I said that they were free to move on now and to go and find their loved ones. Who knows if it did anything, but I felt like we had to try. So I did it with belief and conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed to touch him. Our cat was avidly watching the house spirit cat as usual and following it around. And then he seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes through the kitchen to the back door. We were just watching, fascinated. I said thank you, just in case they were leaving, so we'll see if things get better. We'll see if they seem more peaceful. I certainly slept very well last night, so fingers crossed. This was a few days ago. I was in a room at my school with the Day of the Dead celebration going on. I was taking videos and pictures for my project, which was to cover the holiday for my school, when I accidentally bumped into this shorter girl with black hair. She turns around and I just apologized for bumping into her. She said, oh, it's okay, and turned back around. I start walking toward the exit of the room, and I see a buddy out in the hallway. I go to say hello, and we start walking back to class. Halfway there, the same black-haired girl reappears from around a corner, ahead of us in the halls, which makes no sense. How did she reappear there? I remember just stopping mid-conversation with my buddy, because I was dumbfounded how this girl managed to just teleport across the entire school. This happened a couple of weeks after my dad passed. It was the week that I had gotten a new couch. I fell asleep on it while watching TV. I awoke to the telephone ringing in the middle of the night. I got up and walked around my coffee table, picked up the phone and said, Hello? It was my father. He sounded as chipper as ever. He said, Hello, my dear. I told him that he was dead. He said, Oh, no, dear. I'm just here swimming with the dolphins. 
After hearing him say that, I vaguely remembered walking on a beach and talking with him, a memory I'd nearly forgotten. The next day, I received a phone call from some friends who were down in Mexico. I had given them some of his ashes and told them to disperse them somewhere they thought he would like. As she was talking, I abruptly interrupted her to tell her my story. We hadn't spoken about the ashes at all in this conversation. She went silent for a full minute and finally said, you are never going to believe this. She and her husband had chartered a boat the day previous. They had asked the captain to stop so that they could release their friend who had passed. The captain obliged. Not a minute after they released my father, the dolphins showed up and started to play in the water. They stayed and watched them for an hour. So, yeah, my dad literally was swimming with the dolphins. This happened just a couple of years ago. I went to Ireland to study for a couple of weeks. There, I met this large group of people from my same country. I didn't know anyone. One boy caught my attention among all of them. In the exact same moment I saw him, I thought, I've already seen him. He just seemed so familiar. I approached him and we started talking. I didn't mention to him that he looked familiar. I found out that he lives really far from my city, in a region I have never visited, and that he has never visited my region either. I also found out he arrived in Ireland after me, so there was no way for me to see him at the airport or anything like that. Then, after some time chatting, he said, Have we already met? I was thinking you look really familiar. That really freaked me out. We never figured out how it was possible to feel like we had met each other before, because we certainly never had. And to this day, it just feels like such a glitch in the matrix kind of experience. I don't really know how to explain it. To start off, I haven't gotten much sleep over the past few months. My insomnia has gotten really bad, and my doctors act as if I'm medication-seeking whenever I ask for help. Anyway, the house that I'm in currently, I know for a fact, has some kind of beings living in this big hedge in the backyard. They've been seen all around the house, though. I saw one on a snowy day run from behind my neighbor's parked RV to behind one of those weird trees that looks like a bunch of skinny trees just growing from the same spot. I'm not sure the name of the specific type of tree, but the main point is that you can see through to the other side pretty easily between the little trunks. Anyway, I saw what appeared to be a fat little man, about a foot tall, run from the RV to behind the tree. So, without breaking eye contact with the tree, in case whatever it was ran, I walked over to see if I could find footprints or something, in case maybe it was a rabbit. I got to it, and of course, there were no footprints, nothing in the tree, not even a rabbit or a squirrel. I knew what it was, but I just decided to leave it be and went back inside. A few months later, my little brother saw the same looking thing run in between two of the same types of trees that I mentioned earlier, just on the other side of my house. All he said was it looked like a tiny roundish man running, definitely on two legs, and again, no footprints. It was muddy that day, so if it had been an animal, there should have been footprints. It seems to me like they use those specific trees as some kind of portal or entryway to something. So that's the first being that I had questions about. The second has been happening a lot more recently, and is why I mentioned at first that I have insomnia, because that very well could be what the cause of this was. 
our minds are fragile things when not being cared for properly after all. Within the last month or so, I have seen this thing in my living room. I sleep in my living room because I have too much anxiety to sleep in the back end of my house. I have babies and if something were to happen, I feel like I wouldn't hear it. Both times I've seen this figure, I've been laying in bed trying to sleep. I'll roll over and look at my brick fireplace and I'll see this tiny little humanoid type thing run for just a split second, but it's not fast. It seems like it's a slow motion echo of a child running. I'm not very good at describing these things, but I will try. It was transparent, but I could make out what seemed like bones. It honestly looked like an x-ray or an ultrasound of a child. It was like a sheer white color, like a ghostly skeleton in a way. It had a disproportionately large head and a tiny body. It couldn't have been more than 10 inches tall. As I mentioned before, it looked like I had just seen a slow motion flash of this thing running. It just kind of dissipated after I saw it. I've seen this thing twice in almost the same spot. The spots are maybe five to 10 inches away from each other. I saw it the first time almost a month ago and then last night as well. I was hesitant to tell this story because I had recently heard from people that talking about seeing dwarves or elves or fae will just piss them off. I don't really know. I just wanted to share the experience and ask if anybody has any idea about what this could be. I'm still thinking fae, but not sure. It doesn't feel bad. It seems more playful or curious, but I know things like this can easily deceive. Any input is appreciated. So, let me know if you have any ideas. This story is pretty short, and I have no idea why it happened. But it was pretty late at night, and I wanted to go to sleep. Just right about when I put my head on the pillow and closed my eyes, I immediately had a vision of a gnome, a really short one. In this vision, he stood behind the transparent curtain that was in front of me, since the big window is right at the foot of where I lay. I could clearly see most of his features since the curtain was transparent. He had a huge smile, and he had closed but smiling eyes, bald head, and no beard. His clothes appeared ragged and to be brown and gray in coloring. Right after I had that vision, which didn't seem like my imagination at all, I sat up and I felt really scared. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping near the window. I just couldn't sleep, even though the gnome wasn't there when I opened my eyes. So I went and slept near my sister. Like I said, I don't really know how to explain it but it wasn't my imagination. It wasn't like when you have a random thought or image in your head that you can easily dismiss. This was like I was watching something happen through my eyes that were closed. Anyway, I would just like to know if anyone else has experienced anything like this related to gnomes. I was laying down for a nap. I had my two cats snuggled up with me and my two dogs were outside. All of a sudden I heard toenails on the hardwood floor and then sniffing beside the bed. My brain went, okay, one of the dogs is in here. And then I came instantly all the way awake because my brain went, wait, how did they get in the house? I sat up expecting to see one of the pups sitting beside my bed but there was nothing. I checked all the rooms, no dogs. The doors were all shut. I looked outside and both dogs were still out there. I have no explanation other than perhaps I was dreaming while I was semi-conscious or 
I had a visit from a church grim or black dog. I specifically say church grim because my house is unique. It was originally built attached to a church in the 70s for the pastor's family. My great grandma bought the house in the 90s from the kids of the original pastor. She attended the church and was extremely devout. So when the pastor passed away, she would go into the church from her house every Sunday and turn the heat on and prepare for service. She lived here until she died. Shortly before she died, the church had a new church built, so the old one became abandoned. My grandma inherited the house, and my husband and I bought it from her. So I'm living in my great-grandma's old house that's attached to an old abandoned church. The church still owns the original building, so I don't have access unless I ask. But this is why I think that perhaps I got a visit from a church grim. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to buy alcohol. As we each threw in suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, which is a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 at night. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then we began to head toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning, right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat, a red coat, and this figure was extremely short. This sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. It looked a little bit like a doorway. I didn't really want to stick around. I played it cool as if nothing had happened and returned to my group. And of course, I never mentioned it to anyone. But I'm pretty sure I saw a gnome at Stowe Lake. There's this book called Fairies, Real Encounters with Little People by Janet Board, and in it she discusses stories both old and modern of encounters with fairies and gnomes and things like that. There was this one that was written by a doctor in the late 1700s. He recounted a time when he was just a boy. He and several friends spotted gnomes dancing in a field. They were all holding handkerchiefs between them, like Moorish dancers. He said that when these gnomes spotted them, one of the gnomes chased after them, and even grabbed this doctor as he slipped through a fence. The boy pulled free, and said that the gnome, which he described as having a swarthy face, reached after him, but was unable to grab him a second time. They ran to their parents, who immediately went out looking for these gnomes, but they had disappeared. According to the book, Gnomes and other interdimensional beings were fond of kidnapping children, who would then act as servants in their world. Another story was actually printed in the Anchorage Daily News. A snowmobiler had spotted a young boy in a snow-covered field, all alone, and with no footprints anywhere. The boy just seemed to have appeared there. The boy said that he was taken into a local hill, one that local Eskimos had said was haunted. The boy said he found himself in a city and met a girl who had been kidnapped and brought there 40 years earlier. She asked the boy for help. The boy said that the Inserat, something like that, think it was the name the Eskimos gave these beings, had let him go for whatever reason. I find these stories really interesting, and I'm just curious if anyone else has experiences like these.
My family and I were en route to a beach in San Diego, cruising along the freeway. At the time, I was around 15 or 16 years old. With music in my ears, I found myself gazing up at the clouds through the car window. Suddenly, I spotted an odd triangular shaped black object high in the sky. Given the cloud cover, it was somewhat challenging to keep my eyes on it as it moved. At first, I rationalized that it might be a plane. After all, it's pretty rare to spot UFOs in broad daylight. But as I observed its movements, I began to find its trajectory odd. The object seemed to have its pointed end facing downward, and it was gradually descending toward the ground. Trying to reassure myself, I considered other possibilities, like a weather balloon. But then a thought struck me. Don't planes typically maintain their altitude rather than fly downward? We were nowhere near an airport. As our car journeyed onward and the clouds shifted, I lost sight of the object for a brief moment. Thinking that was the last I would see of it, I was taken aback when I located it again, descending more rapidly than before. Just as I contemplated alerting my family to this sight, the object halted its descent abruptly. To my astonishment, it rocketed upwards at an incredible speed disappearing from my view. Excitedly, I recounted my observation to my family. In response, my father gestured to a formation of jets that suddenly appeared, racing across the sky in the direction the UFO had been. That detail seemed odd, yet at the time I didn't dwell on it too much. To this day, I remain thoroughly puzzled about whatever it was I witnessed. I was really young. I can't remember how young, but I must have been under six. I was at my grandparents, and they have an outside sauna in a building with a workshop next to it. I was with my grandpa, and we were talking about something as we entered the sauna. Then my grandpa goes to the heater to put logs in, or maybe to store them next to it. I can't really remember which. But I was facing the benches as we were talking. The next thing I know, there's a little gnome that peeked its head over and looked straight at me from a hole where all the water goes onto the floor. It must have been only a second because I stood still and silent and then it just went away. I told my grandpa, but I don't know if he took it seriously. I didn't know how to feel. I was fascinated, but a little creeped out by it. Later, my grandpa told me something about gnomes living underground as it is often in Finnish folklore, which made it even more mysterious to me. I know it wasn't a dream, because it shocked me and I remember it so clearly, and I was wide awake. I didn't know where to tell this story, I just thought it would be interesting to tell. For reference, I live in Sweden. My family is very anti-religious, tends to always look to science and logic, and the house that we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person, and is always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, you need a room that is very clean to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment whenever we make the jars of honey. My dad had put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. The labels are on a huge scroll about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes 
before he went outside for about ten seconds just to grab some air. I could see him this entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time that I was watching, I took out my phone. When he came back in, we proceeded to begin again. But from out of nowhere, he asked me what I'd done with the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk, but it wasn't there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start to look all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was pretty tiny, which is why it was so odd for it to just disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still, nothing. This happened about a year ago, and it still freaks me out. Usually, whenever my family and I experience something paranormal, we blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained, and it still leaves a creepy feel. There is seriously nowhere for it to have disappeared to, and that's what still really freaks me out. Even in the highly unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it or heard it. Moral of the story, maybe gnomes still exist in Sweden. When I was seven, I woke up in the middle of the night to steal some biscuits from the kitchen. Our kitchen is right beside our conservatory, which has a big open window that allows you to glance out into the garden. While eating, I heard some chatter from outside. Curious, I went to go peer outside the window. I saw three little men in red pointy hats outside in my garden bickering amongst themselves in a strange language I've never heard of before or after. I was so stricken with terror that I didn't speak. I ran to my parents' bedroom to tell them about the intruders. My dad was reluctant to believe me, but he could see that I was obviously shaken up by something and came downstairs to investigate. They must have heard us coming, because by the time we'd gotten to the conservatory, they'd already pegged it and were running through the back gate. My dad got a glimpse of them too, but he only saw their red pointy hats. I've never seen him look so scared before, or in such complete disbelief. I'm still completely baffled by the whole thing. I believe that I have seen gnomes on more than one account. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never entirely sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I have also never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived in his belated grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a drably dressed little old man, about a foot and a half tall, run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the absolute crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in, and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I've already been through, when he asked me what happened, I told him that I had just slipped. Another thing I once saw might have been a troll, but I'm unsure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you could enlighten me. I'd been doing a lot of meditating, about three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was a three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf troll type thing. 
I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I have had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I've seen them, as well as one childhood encounter with my belated noni, and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways, and nothing abnormal has ever been found, other than some white spots from chronic migraine, and those popped up super recently. I have even been evaluated by a neuropsychologist. No one has ever diagnosed me with anything other than seizures related to the head trauma, but, like I said, that happened after I started seeing these things. I'm not really sure what it is I'm seeing, I just thought it was interesting. In 2016, my girlfriend and I decided to go on our first vacation together. We booked a three-night stay at the Belmont Hotel, not its real name, which was a historic hotel in the old part of the city we were in. It was an elegant manor-style home from the 1850s, and parts of the property looked from that period. Massive staircases, a parlor room, and original furniture throughout. Our first day, we did the usual touristy stuff. Exhausted, we settled into our room and crashed for the evening. Our first night, we barely slept. My girlfriend and I were both uncomfortable sleeping in the room, and we felt like somebody was watching us. A few hours later, at about 3 a.m., we were abruptly awoken to a very loud sound coming from above our room. It sounded like somebody was pulling or pushing a large piece of furniture, that stuttering of wood on wood, and the creaking. It was unbearably loud. This went on ad nauseum for a while. We were totally awake, thinking that somebody was working upstairs, like a staff member moving furniture or rearranging the room. We were both dumbfounded, sitting upright in our beds waiting for this to end. The second day, more touristy stuff. We didn't really think much about the previous night. The second night, we were zonked out and ready to sleep early. This night was strangely similar. We woke up around the same time to the exact same creaking and stuttering of furniture, or something being moved around above us. It eventually stopped like the day before, and we managed to fall back asleep. The next thing I remember is my girlfriend waking me up abruptly, saying, What are you doing? I awoke, standing in the middle of the room in the dark, unpacking my bag angrily and throwing our clothes into the air. I snapped at her for asking me what I was doing and for interrupting me. I was frustrated and agitated upon waking. Suddenly, I vaguely remembered what I was doing, almost like a dream upon waking when you try to hang on to that dream. I sat on the bed and I explained that I was looking for a key in the room, and I remembered wandering around the room desperately, searching the walls, the floors, the furniture with my hands in the dark. I was getting more disturbed the more I explained this to my girlfriend. The idea that I was alone in this dark hotel room doing this really frightened me, because I had no control. Needless to say, we decided to call it early and head home and end our vacation. We drove the full four-hour drive home that night in pitch darkness and fog. I called the hotel that morning to check out early. Speaking with the front desk, I mentioned the loud noises coming from above our room. She replied, There is no room above yours. It's an attic space, and no staff would have been in there at that time. I mentioned that it sounded like somebody was dragging furniture on hardwood. She said that there was a lot of furniture up there, but that no staff member would have been there. I asked her if the hotel was haunted, and after a moment, she responded reluctantly that she's not sure, but she has heard other similar stories.
This is a memory that I have about my family going to the hospital in which I was about to be born. I recently started thinking about this memory again for some reason. It's just something that I cannot find a logical explanation for, considering that I'm a hyper-skeptical guy. The memory is seeing my dad and other family members walking their way out of my grandma's house, where we used to live, to see my mom give birth, my birth, at the hospital. I can perfectly recall how my dad was dressed that day. For the rest of my family, it's kind of a blurred image. My dad was wearing a black blazer and blue tie with pink diagonal stripes, black jeans, and the lighter blue shirt. I remember even how he was walking while smiling, a pretty detailed and vivid sequence of images. So as expected a couple of years ago, I might have been 20 at the time, I'm 28 now, I was going to tell him about this weird memory. But before that, I decided to ask him first about how he was dressed the day of my birth, to make sure he didn't just go along with the memory to fool me. And yes, you guessed it, it was the exact same way that I remember. He said he perfectly remembers since he planned it beforehand what he was going to wear for the day of my birth. I freaked out so hard. I would ask myself how this is even possible. It just doesn't make any sense. So I started trying to figure this all out, and I came up with a theory. I later dismissed it, but... My family used to record my cousins and I all the time in childhood with this old camera and then put them on VHS tapes. So I started thinking that maybe an uncle of mine or someone else had recorded that moment of my family on the way to the hospital. So I decided to go over all the tapes that I had, plus it's fun watching them. But no, I didn't find anything even remotely close to that image that I had in my mind. Plus, after rewatching my life series on these tapes, I realized they started recording after I turned one year old. So, yeah, one-year-old me tapes were the oldest tapes made, nothing before that. Another thing that I realized, the way that I remember this scene of my family couldn't be recorded in this weird angle and perspective. It was like I was looking at them walking, but also being careful to not be seen kind of hiding a little bit behind a wall. Kind of an odd way to record something, right? So that's my story about this weird yet accurate and vivid memory that I have before I was even born. I'm still trying to make sense out of it. Every time I start thinking about it, I can't stop until I sleep. In August of 2019, my mom got sick. She had a stroke, has diabetes, and so on. So the first time that my mom got sick, my brother was the one who stayed with her. And the second time she got sick, I stayed with her. Mostly because my brother couldn't be patient enough to take care of her again. My mom was being placed in a room that could fit six patients. There was this one time that I went to the canteen, and I bought like food and stuff like that. When I was in the elevator, a guy came in, so it was just the two of us. After I bought some things from the canteen, I went back using the same elevator, and I accidentally met the same man again, with the same elevator, just the two of us in it. We talked a little bit before the elevator opened. When it did, we heard some people screaming and crying. He asked me, what happened? Why are they screaming and crying like that? I said, I don't know, maybe a patient just passed away. If yes, may they rest in peace. I barely heard him say, thank you, like whispering. I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said goodbye to him and I walked to my mom's room. After a little bit of conversation, I went back to my mom's room and the crying and screaming voice was actually from that room. So I was kind of curious about who the person was that had passed. The nurse opened the curtain to prepare to move the body, and I was absolutely frozen. The person who had died was the guy that was talking to me in the elevator. 
and two had asked me what had happened. After that day, I had nightmares for a week, and now I'm always pretty paranoid whenever I go into an elevator. I don't know if this story is interesting to anyone else, but it definitely shook me up. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor, and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there, and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior, with no incidents but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal, and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th, first unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room, never cold there again. December 11th, the baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours, was eventually moved to my mother's house where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th. While outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. 
This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never set foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th. My mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room, and before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room, only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine. 
and I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair, standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd, yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side, next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed. I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light, something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped. The pets stopped acting weird and the big bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid twenties and indigenous. I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then, both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, Turn on that light, I'm up here. Now, we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. Who or what made that sound, and how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best, the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it? well enough to fool both my sister and I. To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows?
My boyfriend and I had planned a camping trip in Canton, Oklahoma for October 27th through the 28th of 2018. We arrived at our campsite late in the afternoon and began our usual setup. Unloading the truck, pitching the tent, arranging the chairs around the fire pit, and stacking firewood. I was particularly excited for the evening fire because we had bought this massive log with a central hole soaked in a long burning solution. Once we'd tossed our cozy gear into the tent and set up our lights and speaker, we lounged around the fire pit. We chatted and listened to music as the sun descended. As night settled, my boyfriend lit the fire using the impressive log I had been so excited about. However, as darkness enveloped us, our speaker began emitting a strange, loud, glitchy static on several occasions, something it had never done before. We speculated that the spotty internet or the distance between the phone and speaker might be causing the issue. Despite our decent cell service, we couldn't discern the cause. The erratic static unnerved me, and although my boyfriend didn't voice it, I sensed it bothered him too. To distract ourselves, we decided to dig into our Fritos and bean dip and play with the glow sticks that we had brought. I recall a particularly vivid moment when, as we sat across from each other at the picnic table, my boyfriend crafted glasses from a pack of glow sticks, humorously placing the connector piece in his nostrils, mimicking oxygen tubes. We burst into laughter, but strangely, the next thing I remember is waking up inside the tent, snugly cocooned into a sleeping bag. My boyfriend was shivering, asking if we could share the bag. We exchanged bewildered glances, grappling with our sudden dislocation from the picnic table to the tent. Our mutual confusion only grew as we discussed our last memory, his playful act with the glow stick connector and our shared laughter. That unsettling feeling intensified when I couldn't find my jeans. Out of nowhere, a vivid memory flashed. I was at the picnic table, distressed, trying to remove large thorns from my jeans. My boyfriend was there trying to comfort and assist me. When I shared this with him, he initially brushed it off as a dream. However, my insistence and the discovery of the thorns on my shoelaces triggered his own recollection of the event. Stepping outside the tent, the scene was eerily familiar and untouched. A lone Frito in the bean dip, unbroken glow sticks, and the pack with the connector piece. The fire had burned through all of our wood, and the morning was unusually quiet. The manicured lawns around us made the presence of thorns on my shoes even more perplexing. One odd consolation, I guess, my boyfriend, a former 82nd Airborne Infantry paratrooper who usually woke up with daily pain, felt none that morning. Were we abducted? Were we fleeing from something? What caused our memory gap? While we both believe in extraterrestrial life, we're unsure if this experience can be attributed to that. This encounter has intensified my fear of the dark, and I have vowed to never tent camp again. To this day, neither of us have recovered any further memories from that night, and part of me wonders if it's better that way. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. 
I go to bed and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old Western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently, and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams, and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks, and then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up, 
and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying, and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry. Maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training, too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds. That's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was. Up until the point of 2008, I wasn't okay with the supernatural, nor did I put much stock into it. I was already socially awkward enough as it was, and I was stuck in that awful teenage phase of not like other girls, but I also didn't think that I was special enough to see ghosts, an idea that I would come to regret. I'd really be okay now if I never saw one again. For more context, after we had moved into this house during the summer of 07, my parents noted that I had undergone a significant personality change. I was suddenly nasty, aggressive, abusive to people who had never harmed me before, even to my friends. Previously, I was just a goofy kid that teachers didn't quite know how to talk to, but I was otherwise considered very bright and pleasant to be around. I was no stranger to moving every other year, and this move had barely bothered me, so they knew I wasn't just upset. It was late one night, my dad was away for work, and it was just me, my mother, my little brother, and my dog that week. For some reason, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. I sat up in bed to see a dark figure standing in the corner of my room, almost indiscernible at first glance. I didn't yell, I didn't panic at first, because I thought that I had to be dreaming. I wasn't special, and non-special people don't do cool things like see ghosts. I tried to fall back asleep, but it was pretty tricky, and I felt like I was being watched for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked to sleep in another room, slightly more fearful now, but thinking I just needed a change of pace. It was a fluke, and by sleeping elsewhere, my brain would reset, and I would be fine. I had not just seen a ghost. My mother thought that I was acting up for attention but figured it wasn't the hill to die on and let me sleep elsewhere. So I did. That thing followed me. It waited at the foot of my bed all night, staring me down as I tried to sleep. I was so exhausted from the lack of sleep the previous night that I did manage to drift off, but it was a restless sleep. I tried to envision myself surrounded by white light, like the Tolkien elves, hoping that it might repel the darkness. The third day, I was sat at the table with a few friends and their mothers and my own family. We had just had dinner and were doling out the cinnamon rolls when I suddenly felt my whole body get heavy, like somebody had just added a 50 pound weight to my skull. I couldn't stop it. I slumped forward in my chair, despite my grabbing at the back of it to stay upright. My eyes just about rolled into the back of my head. Someone asked me if I was okay. I couldn't see. 
I couldn't see, and yet I could. I suddenly saw a flat plain stretched out before me, and everything was gray. The dark figure stood right in front of me. And then it rushed me. It ran at me so fast I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything. I had to fight to pry my jaws apart, and I screamed. It was like the screaming released me, and I about knocked my chair into the wall I shot back so hard. I was sobbing, and I could hardly catch my breath, while everyone tried to figure out what was wrong. I told my mother what I saw, that the thing was back and that it tried to hurt me. I think this finally convinced her that I wasn't crazy, that something was wrong and I wasn't just trying to get attention. I wasn't a crier, I hated being caught crying. After I was calmed down, she took her two friends upstairs with her to my room. She didn't tell me until several years later that her friends had seen it, had seen this dark presence in my room, could prove that I wasn't lying, that I wasn't crazy. The dog often followed her around the house while she was doing chores, but he refused to go anywhere near my room. He actually growled at my room, hackles raised kind of a growl. Even after we moved to a new house, my dog never wanted to stay long in my room again. I don't know if it was because he remembered the bad thing from before, or if something had been irreparably broken in me, or was now a part of me. I couldn't walk into churches anymore without having sudden, unexplainable breakdowns. I would feel like hands were choking me. I would struggle to breathe. I would feel a hundred emotions at once and start sobbing. Needless to say, I quit entering churches after more than a few bad experiences. We found a journal in my room a few months before I moved out for uni, full of crazy ramblings, written by something that said it was a monster, that my parents would unalive me if they discovered I was no longer human, that it would have to hurt my family first to stay alive. I burned it immediately, and I tossed the remnants into the trash can. The scariest part of that was, all of it was in my handwriting, and yet I don't remember writing any of it. My family still wonders to this day what it was. Germany is small and so many new things got built on top of old things all the time. We lived close to Celtic tombs, had visited old mounds and tall obelisks mounted on them. We lived next to a walled city. Buildings in the village could be dated back several centuries prior and were still inhabited by people today. Maybe our home was on top of someone's grave. The weirdest coincidence of all was that the people who had lived there before us had developed a reputation of being quite nasty as well. I wonder if they'd always been that way, or if maybe the same thing that happened to me, and changed me, changed them, too. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single bedroom all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway our rooms were in, I remember almost feeling as though I walked into a wall of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that that wing of the hotel was odd. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about two o'clock in the morning, I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, 
A huge looming black shape was visible in the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only for nothing to be there. The window was locked from the inside, and there was nobody in the closet or the bathroom. My room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing games on my DS. The next morning we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned on the light, there was nobody there. It was just a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I never got to experience anything after that. But it still freaks me out to this day. For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then, another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, Hello? No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused we asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently, they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul. I was little, like kindergarten starting first grade little. I lived in Germany at the time due to being an army brat. My little sister is two years younger than me, so we did everything together. We lived in a two-story farmhouse style home, and my little sister and I were playing in our room. I don't remember when he came, but we started playing with a boy a little bit older than us. I don't remember ever seeing him, just talking to him and playing games and other kids stuff. It was like he kind of just appeared. My sister and I would later realize that the little farm boy was kind of a jerk because he would turn off the lights in whatever room we were in, mostly our bedroom, and lock the doors. We would find each other in the dark, scared, but also a little bit annoyed. I remember telling my sister to try to find the light and I would get the door. They were both next to each other. I couldn't open the door, so I began to bang on it, when my sister, in a panicked voice, said that she couldn't find the light. 
I was kind of mad scared, and I thought that she was pulling my leg. And she was small, so I was like, move over, let me try. I felt around the area where I know the light switch was, but all I found was a wall. Confused, I decided to find the bottom of the wall, use both of my hands, and just slide them all the way up as high as I could. Nothing. I then told my sister to do what I had just done, and I would do the same at the top. But we would do kind of a slow zigzag pattern just in case we weren't going far enough. Our hands eventually grazed each other, and we realized we couldn't find a thing. There was no light switch. So I turned back to the door, and I ordered my little sister to start banging on the door and screaming. We did this for what felt like forever. I was even more confused because mom should be making dinner right now and dad would be getting home soon or he already was. My other older sisters were never home so they weren't on my list of rescuers. My little sister and I started to give up, thinking that this was just our life now, in the dark next to the door. We weren't about to go into the abyss behind us. Then all of a sudden our mom came to the door and we shouted that we were stuck. Dad got us out, and my little sister and I were pissed. We thought they were being mean and meant to do that to us. We started saying, didn't you hear us? We were shouting and banging on the door. They looked confused and said, we never heard anything. We told them about the farm boy and that we didn't want to play with him if he kept doing that. We actually played with that boy until we left, and I'm still quite miffed about some of the things that he did. But looking back on it, I don't know. That's one heck of a prank, right? I'm starting to wonder what that boy was really up to, if he was even a little boy at all. This was back in 2006. A group of friends and I decided to spend the weekend in Germany to watch some of the World Cup games in the local town squares of Frankfurt. We flew in from the UK. Things go as expected, lots of beer and lots of fun. The evening is getting really late and we find ourselves struggling to find any more bars open at the time. We end up walking a bit and we find ourselves at the river. We decide to walk along it to see if we come across any place that's open. It's mostly just trees, grass, and small parks. It was clear that we weren't going to find anywhere here to get a drink. We rounded a corner, and all of a sudden there are these huge tents with music playing, a good amount of people, and beer being served. Great, we hit the jackpot. So we all find a table. It wasn't a waitress-style venue. More like a mini festival vibe, so I offer to go buy drinks at the bar and bring them back. The girl at the bar asks me what I'd like, in German. She realizes that I am English from my terrible German and we start chatting in English. After a few exchanges, she says that she wants to introduce me to someone and to follow her behind the bar. So I follow her and we walk behind the bar and out behind the tent. It's quite a large open space, with no one else there except a group of guys in the back corner of this grassy area. She walks straight toward these guys and introduces me to them, with something along the lines of, Hey, this guy is English too. I think you'll get along. She then turns around and walks back to where we'd come from, leaving me with these guys. I say hello and we start small talking. I can't really remember what about where I'm from in England, and why I'm in Germany, things like that. Turns out these guys are from the same town as where one of the friends that I'm with is from. I end up chatting with them for what seems like an hour or so, to the point where I completely lost track of time. That's when my friend finds me. I see him walking across the grass from the tent. He says they're about ready to leave and to come on with them. I say sure, but just before we leave, let me introduce you to my new friends, as they're from your town. He says hello and asks where about in the town they live. 
It turns out they live on the same street as one of my friend's uncles. My friend asks perchance if he knows his uncle, and the guy says, yeah, actually, it's his dad. Now both of these guys realize that they're first cousins. My original friend's dad isn't in his life anymore, and he doesn't ever have any contact with that side of the family, but obviously knows who they are. So it kind of makes sense that these guys have never met each other before, but they know who each other are once they connected the dots. Anyway, they chit chat a bit, exchange numbers, and they still keep in touch to this day. As we're walking away from the group, my friend asks me why I decided to go up to these guys in particular and strike up a conversation. So I tell him about the girl behind the bar who wanted to introduce us. That's when he looks at me really weirdly and explains that he watched me go to the bar to get drinks. According to him, it looked like I was speaking to nobody. And then I just wandered through to the back area behind the bar. It was fully open so he could see through. And I walked directly over to this group of guys and then stood there talking for that hour. My friends ended up deciding to leave me to it and just got drinks themselves until they were ready to leave. To this day, my friends do not believe me that there was any girl or third party there. To them, I just walked up to a bar, spoke to no one, and then walked up to a random group of guys in a reasonably busy beer tent away from the main area. And then one of them ended up being my friend's first cousin. Since I was making a big deal about how there was definitely somebody that introduced us, otherwise why would I hone in on a bunch of strangers and start chatting, my friend ended up calling his cousin to ask him exactly what happened. Apparently, I did just walk up to them with no one else there and start chatting. They found it a bit weird, but they just went with it. Now, I don't know if it's a glitch or what, but it's really odd, especially because we're in a different country. If we were in the same town or even anywhere in the UK, it might not have been that weird and I could have explained it away, but we hadn't bumped into any other British people the entire weekend. Anyway, I've always dwelled on this and I just refuse to accept that there wasn't somebody who introduced us. I remember it vividly. And I know that being drunk doesn't help me and it makes me question my version of events too. But I remember this person. I mean, I've gone drinking a lot and I've never hallucinated before. So I honestly don't know how to explain it. This incident in particular happened late one night in my grandma-in-law's kitchen. Grandma had a sister-in-law who was visiting from the East Coast. She had gotten in late that night, and I went over to visit the two of them with my husband. We were all sitting around the kitchen table, the same one that my grandpa-in-law's mother had owned when she built the house. There were a lot of jokes going around the table, and Grandma started coughing from laughing too hard. Now, she was in poor health as it was, and she was supposed to take breathing treatments. However, with her having so much fun, a rare occasion since Grandpa had passed, she didn't want to leave the table. My husband was concerned and told her that she had to take her breathing treatment. After some convincing, she got up and started heading in that direction. But then she got sucked back into the conversation and distracted from her treatment again. She again started coughing heavily. This was the moment when my husband told her again she needed to take her treatment. He said, if grandpa saw you right now, he'd be nagging you to take your treatment. That's right, my grandma's sister-in-law said. Don't make me have him call you. Grandma gave a little, yeah, right, kind of chuckle. Right at that moment, the sister-in-law's track phone that she only uses when traveling started to ring. We all stood there spooked for a moment, and the sister-in-law went to answer it. Immediately, it disconnected, as soon as she opened it, after several rings. The weirdest part is that this was at like 11.30 p.m. East Coast time, 
on a phone that nobody would have the number to outside of my immediate family. Grandma immediately took her breathing treatment after that, not wanting to argue with what could have been a message from beyond the grave. Her husband had always diligently reminded her about her treatments while he was alive, so we didn't think it would be unusual for him to do the same after. I'm not sure what exactly happened there, but I like to think that it was Grandpa. I know my grandma felt that way too, especially after other instances of footsteps in the house and sounds of him getting up in the night for water long after he passed. About 20 years ago, my best friend at the time and his wife had her father, Felix, living with them. They were his caretakers. They pretty much did everything for him, and that included cleaning him every morning because of his incontinence and difficulty holding his bowels. They really did a great job and deserved my compliments several times. One day, my friend Mike went into Felix's room when he would normally be awakening only to find him in full rigor mortis. Felix had sadly passed sometime in the night. I was employed at the time as a cemetery pre-need salesman, but also could arrange at-need services, and so I did. I helped them to prepare Felix's final resting location and waived my commission as it just didn't feel right charging it. These two individuals had done so much to make his last years comfortable I just couldn't take that money. About a week later, we held the service, which I officiated. It was well attended and we gave Felix the send off he deserved. I rode home in the limo provided for the family by the funeral home and cemetery after the service. And we all sat around for a while, just decompressing and taking a well needed break. The wife, Mary, then noticed that there was a message on their answering machine. This was during the time where we had physical landlines and attached answering machines. She pressed the play button and the timestamp that the machine read was the identical time as when we had started the graveside service. It was recorded at 11 a.m. sharp. We thought at first it was just somebody who had missed the service calling to wish condolences. When the recording started though, every jaw in the room dropped and an oddness to goodness chill filled the room. There were five of us present, Mike, Mary, the daughter, myself, my brother James, and a friend of theirs from across the street whose name I don't know. The background noise was the first thing we heard. It sounded like somebody was in a room with a large group of people. You know, lots of audible voices, but nothing we could discern. Then Felix spoke. The voice on the recording was clearly and unmistakably Felix. He said, please do not follow me. Then the recording stopped. We had what seemed like a recently deceased parent calling us during his own funeral service, begging us to please not follow him. The rest of the group talked about what he could have meant. Don't follow him to death. Not possible, they said. Don't follow his life choices. He had made many bad ones during his life. The daughter absolutely believes that he was saying, don't follow me into hell. She believed until her dying day that her father had made contact one last time, telling her to not follow his path and end up where he did once he took that step into the unknown. I always thought that was so strange. 20 years later, and I remember that moment and the stunned silence, shock, and fear, just like it happened yesterday. Nobody was comforted. It honestly felt chilling. I still don't know what he meant, but I am 100% certain that the phone call was definitely from Felix, and it definitely came from the other side.
four years after my dad died, I was going through an amicable divorce, or at least it seemed so at the time. I was actually happier than I had been in a decade, and I was looking forward to the future. One morning, I woke up, grabbed my cell phone off the charger, and walked toward the kitchen. Just as I was going to swipe my phone open, a phone call was coming through, but all it said was incoming call. It didn't show a name or a number. I was already mid-swipe, so the call was answered. I put it to my ear and said, Hello? The reply, Hey girl, was my dad's voice. It sounded like my dad was far away. I was completely taken off guard, but at the same time I was cool and calm. I said, Daddy? He said, Yes, I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to make sure you're okay. I said, I'm fine, are you okay? And he said he was. Then he said, I have to go now. I'll call again, I love you. I said, okay daddy, I love you too. I'll talk to you later. He said, bye. And then silence. I took the phone away from my ear and it had gone back to the home screen. When I looked in the call log, the call didn't appear. I couldn't figure it out, and I thought about it constantly. A week later, my soon-to-be ex came into my house and started kicking things and ranting. I tried to close my bedroom door to shut him off from us, but he shoved it open and hurt my hand. I grabbed my phone and called the police, and so he quickly left. He never came back after that night, but I was on high alert after that and finally installed an alarm just in case he ever decided to break in. The day after my ex did that, I told my mom about the call from dad the week before and about my ex coming into the house the past night. She said that my dad had never trusted my ex and always thought that he had done something on purpose years before that hurt me, even though at the time I thought it had been an accident. My dad had never said a word to me about his feelings toward my then husband, so this was news to me. The best we could speculate was that my dad was worried that my ex was going to hurt me. So somehow, from the other side, he called to check on me. It was just weird that we never acknowledged the elephant in the room, like, hey, you're dead, or hey, I think your ex is a sneaky, dangerous person who wishes to harm you. I guess if my dad ever calls again, I'll know there may be something he wants me to know. So I plan on asking more questions instead of being so dumbfounded by a phone call from a dead person. This encounter didn't happen to me, but to my mother. A couple of months ago, my great aunt was in the hospital with the virus. At first, it seemed like she was stable and would recover, but things took a turn for the worst about a week in. She had a heart attack, her lungs became damaged beyond repair, and she was brain dead, being kept alive by a machine. My cousins had to make a decision to keep her on it or let her pass. They went with the latter and she passed away. Due to the fact that she had the virus, my immediate family and I were unable to visit her, as she was three hours away and we didn't have the means to travel there, especially on such short notice. We were kept in the loop through phone calls from our family members though. Although my mother managed to keep her composure during all of this, she took her death pretty hard, as she was really close with her growing up, and it was one of the few extended family members that she still talked to who was alive. Personally, for me, I hadn't spoken with her for quite a few years prior to this, but I do have great memories spending time with her during my childhood and teenage years. It's sad to think that so many of my family members growing up have now passed away. She had two dogs that my family and I took in, as my cousins were unable to. They were a mess when they first came into my house, as their last memories of my aunt were being rushed out of her apartment to the hospital, sparking anxiety in them 
and and being brought to a new home with people they haven't seen in well over a decade was a bit anxiety provoking. I'm happy to report that they have acclimated to our home very well, and we've all been doing our absolute best to give them a happy and healthy life. A few weeks after the funeral, my mother was sleeping and was awoken by a phone call around midnight. She sleepily looked at her phone and jolted awake when she saw that it was my aunt calling. I'll be paraphrasing this, but here's essentially what my mother told me. When she answered the phone, she was greeted by my aunt, and my mother immediately asked, How are you calling me? To which my aunt replied, Don't worry about it. My aunt went on to tell her that she wanted to let her know that she was okay and was now with several family members that had passed long before she did. Her husband, her mother, her sister, and so on. She wanted to let my mother know that she was very thankful for taking her dogs in and was glad to see that they were being well taken care of. She asked my mother to deliver a message to my cousin, her closest daughter. She wanted her to know that she didn't feel any pain when she passed and that she was in a better place now. My mother understood and told her that she would tell her. My aunt thanked her, said she loved her, and the call ended. My mother is pretty open to the paranormal, so she wasn't too freaked out by this and was very thankful and happy to have heard from her. The next morning, she delivered the message to my cousin. She teared up on the phone and thanked my mother for telling her. Now, I do recognize that this could very easily have just been a dream or some kind of hallucination on my mother's part. However, she swears that she was very awake and very aware during the phone call. She was walking around the house as she was on the phone with my aunt, and my sister was awake at the time and confirmed that she heard my mom walking around the house and having a conversation. My mom also has no history of sleepwalking or hallucinating for as long as I've been alive. And I'm assuming before that too. I personally believe that it was my aunt contacting her and it makes me happy knowing she's out there in a better place with the people that she loves. not dear. For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups, four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, so we started looking up some lesser-known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Knot Deer, in some cases the Night Deer. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, quote, it was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same, end quote. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the Knot Deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I had discovered and being spontaneous as I am, told them I would be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. 
I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it. But as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he had decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS and I headed out. My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we had bought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at the time, with our arrival in Boone being at around 9.10 p.m. But all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back at about 9.30, and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving, so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get really bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees, almost no streetlights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still, there was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight, since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times, we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there, like it was somewhere we were not supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular too, it wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is just that sense of wrongness. It came in waves, not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said that they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you would expect a monster to be. We started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we just weren't supposed to be there, and we felt like we had to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, 
That put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared by anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road. I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel the absolute worst we'd ever felt. Like things are very wrong and something was about to happen. My roommate said that my eyes were glazed over, and I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here, over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got, until it was just, I just need to turn around right here. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person, and I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was very difficult to see far ahead. He said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt really bad, but I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason I was having a difficult time hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there. We could not stop, and we could not go back that way. It took him using his road rage voice to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we had gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something that we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. Back in the mid-80s, we were traveling through Tennessee on our way to visit friends in Texas. My mom was driving. I, a teenager at the time, was navigating by using a paper map. These were the days before cell phones and GPS. We made it past Nashville on I-40 pretty late at night. We're maybe an hour outside the city. I'm charting our progress, old school with pencil and paper. We pass an exit, and I mark it. A minute later, a summer thunderstorm hit. Visibility dropped to nothing. All traffic slowed to a crawl, and we decided to pull off at the next possible exit and just find a motel to spend the night, because there was no way we were making any significant progress in this storm. Slow, white-knuckle driving ensued. An exit loomed up on the right. No signage that we could see in the downpour, but we took it. At the top of the exit ramp, we turned right toward a brilliantly lit up gas station. The left turn was onto an overpass crossing I-40, no lights from that side of the interstate. At this point, we were on a dinky little road. 
To our right, there was the gas station, which we were rapidly passing. To our left and back behind some trees was what looked like a motel, but you couldn't make out the sign very well in the rain. We drove past the gas station before we realized that the road just ended up ahead. The gas station was the only building on this side of the road. It went from one and a half lane paved to one lane gravel. We could only see a short way ahead. Tire track, dirt, and grass all over the space of maybe 20 yards. Now we were past the gas station. There was only one turnoff from this road and it was on our left. We took it and tried to back up and turn around to get back to the gas station. Unfortunately, the paved slope of that narrow driveway-sized turnoff led steeply down into a huge mud pit. No backing up off of it. Mom put the car into low gear, turned hard, and headed back for the gravel road through the mud. We almost made it out, but we got mired. The front passenger tire caught on the corner of an exposed concrete storm drain, maybe three feet from the road. We got out of the car and into the rain and mud, and we walked to the gas station. The place was spotless, super bright, and had two young men behind the counter. What sounded like one of Elvis's songs was playing on the radio inside. The attendant's first words on seeing us walk in were, did you get stuck in the mud? And they said it super enthusiastically, like a way too happy greeting, like a Disney staffer welcoming you as you walked into the park for the very first time, that kind of happy to see you. Also, these night shift clerks were dressed in suits that looked about 30 years out of date. The whole place was kind of creepy. We admitted we had gotten stuck, and we asked if there was a tow truck company we could call. They pulled out a phone book, again, this was before cell phones or the internet, and started talking to each other. It wasn't a Nashville phone book, though. Some little township. A population that couldn't have been more than a hundred from the handful of white pages. But the book had dozens of yellow pages of nothing but tow truck companies. If you're unfamiliar, white pages were people and yellow pages were companies. There were literally hundreds of tow truck companies for this town too small to appear on the map. The attendants had a friendly debate about whose turn it was to come get a car out of the mud. They decided to skip over the company who was theoretically next because there had been some sort of problem with them the last time they were called out for a tow. They made a decision about who to call and let mom use their phone. More weirdness, creepiness intensifies. It was still storming, though less now. The tow truck arrived maybe five minutes later. Brilliant white, not a speck of dirt or a drop of mud on it. I have seen vehicles in a new car lot that were dirtier than this thing. Two young men in the truck were also dressed like they had just stepped out of the 1950s. Freshly polished patent leather shoes without a drop of mud on them. Starched white shirts, paper hats, bow ties. We hiked across the street and next door to the mud pit where our car was stuck. The tow truck guys were horrified. They almost got out of the mud, they said to each other repeatedly. The subtext from their shocked tone was clear. No one must ever, ever escape the mud pit on their own. These people would have to take some sort of action to make sure no one else got as close as we did to escaping. They towed our car out. Easy peasy. We all went back to the gas station and paid the tow truck drivers for their service. The drivers let the gas station attendants know that my mom and I almost made it out of the mud on our own. The attendants were horrified and shocked by this. By now we were getting really big Uncanny Valley vibes from all four of these men. And not just them. The whole place was too clean, too brightly lit, too strangely out of date. It was a surprisingly good facsimile of a small town rest stop populated by real humans, just in the wrong decade. Almost perfect, in fact. We were definitely in creepy town. If these guys were human, there was something seriously off about them. If they weren't, they almost had their ordinary human act down pat. The tow truck drivers went off and the attendants turned all super friendly again, 
and asked my mom and I if we were going to stay the night in the hotel across the road. They got so excited that we might spend the night here. They talked about how great it was. Mom and I made non-committal noises and returned to the car. On our way back, I said, we are not staying here tonight. She agreed wholeheartedly. The rain is finally letting up, so we were really excited to get back out on the road. We drove straight back out onto the interstate. Didn't pass go, didn't collect $200, didn't even go near the Creepy Towns Motel parking lot. We drove down I-40 to the very next exit. It was maybe five miles. We pulled off and spent the night in a kind of crappy but refreshingly ordinary motel. At least it's not the Bates Motel, we joked. The rest of the trip went really well. Several days later, on the way home, my mom and I decided we really wanted to see this creepy town in the light of day. I mean, it couldn't have been that weird, could it? Heading back up I-40, we passed the exit where we actually did spend the night on the way down. We could see the hotel, the exit number matched the notes, everything. Then we started looking for the next exit. The exit to Creepy Town. Should have been about five miles along with an overpass. Five miles pass. No exit. No overpass. Five more miles later before we find the next exit off of I-40. It's the one I had marked as being right before the storm first hit. In short, Creepy Town doesn't exist. The exit doesn't exist. The gas station doesn't exist. I've traveled I-40 many times since, often remarking, hey, there's that non-existent exit where the weird storm hit and we went to Creepy Town. And then there's the exit where we actually did spend the night. To this day, and we've looked multiple times, we have never found Creepy Town exit. In fact, we've never found a single exit between those two points ever again. I have no explanation. East Tennessee is known for its ghost stories and storytelling in general, as is common in Appalachian culture. The Cherokee felt connected to the region spiritually, and the Europeans that replaced them have too. Just look up the legend of the Wampus Cat sometime. Here's my own set of stories, all in relation to Johnson City, as I am originally from that area. In college, before any of my friend group could drink, we got wild hairs and decided to go ghost busting, as we called it. This usually involved us loading up into a vehicle and cruising through the hollows and hills of East Tennessee. We had done our research, be it on the internet or in local ghost story books, and found quite a few places to explore. The first of which I'll mention is the Exit 27 ramp off of I-26 near Irwin. Legend has it that a group of high schoolers were killed by a driver while coming off the ramp one night, many decades ago, after prom. Now their spirits watch the ramp, pushing vehicles back up the ramp and away from the bisecting road. I can personally attest to this experience. If you go at night, and there usually isn't any other traffic, you can stop your car on the bottom of the ramp and put it in neutral. Doing so will make your car roll back up the ramp. The second place is also near Irwin. It's called Bumpus Cove. From what I can remember, there were several stories about this place, including a Confederate cemetery with ghosts. We could never find it, and the GPS kept taking us to a house. Those poor people. We did, however, find a family cemetery with a paved road around it. Legend had it that if you drove around this cemetery on a full moon three times, a ghost jeep would chase you down the mountain. This cemetery was very isolated and near the Cherokee National Forest. I don't think we ever managed to do this on a full moon. We still got scared, though. Since the cemetery sat on a hill, we would see illuminated crosses poking up around the graves. Under a night sky, it's pretty horrifying, even if it's not overtly paranormal. 
The third story I will share is of the Job Cemetery in downtown Irwin. The cemetery is located in town, but sinks down into a creek and heavily forested area. I believe at the back end there's a large, or once was a large, railroad yard. Well, legend has it that the ghost of a murderous homeless person, who apparently was killed in a brawl in Irwin, haunts the cemetery. We explored the cemetery numerous times, but never saw much once again. It was very creepy and unsettling to go back down into the back of the cemetery, so close yet so far away from the living world. Another story we found was about an abandoned old house called Gwendolyn's House, which sits off Bristol Highway between Piney Flats and Elizabethan. This house was allegedly haunted, and tales of it can be found, or could be found when we looked years ago, on topics. I don't really know the backstory, but we went to it on several occasions and got scared out of our minds. The house sat on a one-lane road, possibly called Kuntz Road or something, and was literally falling in. Two people in our group were brave enough to check it out, but another guy and I stayed in the car. The one in the car with me was a friend who boasted about believing in ration and logic and obviously didn't believe in ghosts. Well, he ended up having a panic attack in the car and swore he was seeing an old lady in the upper story window, rocking in a chair, looking and pointing right at him. I think the most infamous ghost story of East Tennessee is the Sense of Awe Tunnel, which last I checked was closed off to the public. Much information can be found about this online, and people can tell it better than me, so it's worth reading the backstory. The tunnel is haunted by the ghost of a person who abducted and drowned a child in the creek running through the tunnel about a hundred years ago. You can hear a baby cry in the tunnel, which we believe strongly we did on numerous occasions. An omen for death, at least in those parts, is a black dog. There was also a legend that we came across of a black dog roaming the highways. Well, one night after visiting the tunnel, we were driving out of the old back road that the tunnel was on, and I almost hit a black dog. This was a narrow, one-lane road, and it sat near the Holston River. The mist was up, and I couldn't see the dog until the last second. Luckily, it didn't get hit. It must have jumped out of the way at the last moment or simply disappeared into thin air. But either way, East Tennessee is creepy. A couple of months ago, while I was sitting in a car wash, my music stopped which always occurs when a call comes through. I looked at the media system to see who was ringing. It said, ma'am, M-A-M. I went to answer and nobody was there and the call ended. Ma'am isn't really common here, but it is what I called my mom and how she signed off on her birthday cards. She was never ever stored in my phone as ma'am though. It was always under dad and it still is because they only had one landline between them. No missed or received calls on my phone were logged during that time. The thing is, my mom's been dead for a while now. Three years, in fact. I shrugged it off as stress, except yesterday it happened again when I was driving. My husband was in the passenger seat and he saw it with his own eyes. It occurred three times. The first time, the line was open for at least a minute, but nobody spoke. The second time, a bit shorter, and the third time, mere seconds. My husband is a complete skeptic, but he can't explain this, and neither can I. I did think maybe it was a spoofed number, but again, there's no record of the calls. It's like they never happened.
Today I went to the same place I've been twice before. I mean exactly the same place, identical in every way. The thing is, every time I've been there, it's in a different state. The first time I was in Alabama, off Highway 10, between the state line and Mobile in 2012. The second time was off Highway 55 in Mississippi, north of Batesville in 2015. This time it was in Tennessee, off Highway 65 near Spring Hill. I have moved around a bit, and I've definitely gotten a sense of deja vu before, but that's not what this was. I mean this place is the same in every single way. The same long, curving exit off of three different highways, a left turn at a desolate three-way stop, leading to a small, single-story building on the right side of the road. The building doesn't look that old. Definitely a newer construction, but there's nothing really else around it other than trees and farmland. The lobby is the same. The furniture and its layout are the same. When brought back to an office, it feels like it wasn't really meant to be an office because there are three doors. The one we enter through and then two behind me leading to other parts of the building that I can't really see much of. Maybe a copy room and a break room or something. On the desk, there's the same pink stapler on the corner, the same garbage can that looks out of place along the wall between the two doors. The only thing that's ever different are the people. The first time in Alabama, it was a staffing company that I was interviewing with. It stood out because it felt so out of place. I had never been in that area before. I was 100% sure I was lost and about to be the main character of a true crime show. The second time, in Mississippi, it was an occupational therapist that I was sent to see because of a work-related disability. It felt very eerie, but I chalked up all the similarities to coincidence. I mean, how else do you rationalize that? Today was the third time, in Tennessee, and it was a legal office. I had an appointment with a lawyer for a consultation over some financial matters. As soon as I walked in the door, I was ready to leave. This was no longer just a coincidence. I knew I had been there before. For the third time, everything was exactly the same. Only the people were different. I have never been more uncomfortable in my life. The whole thing felt wrong in every way. I got the meeting over with as soon as possible, and I will never go back there again. But who knows when I might walk into that building once more. Just somewhere else. Has anyone ever experienced this? Is it some kind of a glitch? I'd really love some answers. So this story might be a bit long, but it sure was a fun one. For me personally, anyway, as I rather enjoy these kinds of things. I come from a very religious family, and a lot of us have had paranormal encounters. My grandmother's house was haunted by someone who apparently hung themselves in the backyard many years before they even built the house. To this day, they frequently have priests come in and bless every room in the house. So many of my family members have been able to see things that the regular eye cannot, including me from a young age, when I used to see things in my house, which once even drove me to run into a locked door hard enough to get a concussion. That's another story for another day. Anyway, this story takes place around late October of last year. I am a student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, so most of my friends lived in their own flats around campus. And my one friend, Bianca, had lived in a small one-person flat that was really quiet and small. Basically a long hallway of a room leading onto a balcony. So we all used to hang out in her room while listening to music, playing Uno, drinking beer, and getting really stoned until early in the morning, as all good students do. We had this game that we called the universe game, where you basically just ask the universe a question, 
and she had this mega playlist of songs. So she would put it on ultimate shuffle, and whatever song would play after the question would be the universe's answer. Whatever interpretation you took from it and worked for you. So there had been a couple of nights where we'd been hanging out, and the lights would just start to flicker in weird beats. Now, my friends didn't know at the time that I could feel these kinds of things coming, before and as they happened. So they just dismissed it as the switch just freaking out a little bit. But this kept on happening more and more each day. Until one night, we were all playing the game again. And when the answer came, the lights acted up again. This time, we looked over to the light switch and saw a faded white hand at the switch. Just the hand, flicking the switch. It just disappeared, and the lights went back to normal. At this point, everyone was freaking out. But I was really just kind of excited by it. For some reason, it just didn't feel like a threatening presence. It was oddly playful to me. I kept this to myself and just played along with everyone else's reactions. So, one night a few weeks after that, my friends were all out of town, and I had a key to my friend's place. I decided I would go over there and stay for a few nights, just to hang out and draw on my favorite couch. It all went smoothly, and I was actually getting some nice work done. I had been playing the universe game a lot throughout this time, and this one night close to 3 a.m., I was drawing and playing the game. I decided to go on to YouTube to find a random playlist to mix things up, because I don't know, I'm a rebel like that. So I find one. I ask a couple of questions and things go smoothly, and as I'm drawing, I suddenly just get a weird surge of energy through me, and at the same time the lights start going bananas. I look down at my phone, and the song playing is called Ghost. I had not smoked nearly enough to make that up, or to see that. Anyway, I jumped up and looked around to see whatever was going on, but as usual, it ended as soon as it started. I must say that this was one of the more pleasant experiences I had ever had in this line of things, and I'm not even getting into my sleep paralysis and night terrors. I've experienced a lot of strange things, but like I said, this one was actually pretty cool and I thought I would share. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room, so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. 
Later, other things began to happen, and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So, I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was unfortunately all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill, drink some coffee, hang out and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. In a small town in South Africa named Pilgrim's Rest, ghost stories are ever prominent amongst the locals. One school holiday, I went to visit some family who had an old gable house on the outskirts of town. Being gifted with the ability to speak with the dead, I loved going there. I would sit in the fields or near the old railway as they would show me flashbacks of the town's early days. But that holiday, something terrible was shown to me terrible to the point that I have never returned to the town. Not because I don't want to, but more because I'm not wanted. 
See, I discovered a dark secret of that town, and what I saw left a scar. I was out on my usual night walk through the old children's cemetery, which was established during a plague. Most of the graves remained unmarked, but all the years of death, say 1886. I loved watching the kids play under the full moon, but then I saw them, the miners. They were walking from a part of the forest that I was told was off limits, but they looked sad. They looked as if they were forgotten. The next day I went into that part of the forest, and eventually after about a two hour hike, I found the miners again. Approaching slowly, I made them aware that I could see them, and that's when they told me the story of their gruesome death. Back in those days, witchcraft and curses still scared people, and the founding families had been brainwashed into believing that the reason the plague hit the town so hard was because they were mining on sacred ground. But instead of following the right procedures to stop mining, they just decided to collapse the mine right on top of all 50 miners. They claimed that it was an accident and then proceeded to leave the miners buried under the rubble and erased from history. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair, staring at the TV, 
but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-styled dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night. And if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school and he hands me the binoculars and says, look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell. There was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird to say the least. The Girl from Catholic School My story happened in 2013. 
For some context, I was staying in my grandparents' home, which was over a hundred years old in South Africa. I had experienced other unexplainable occurrences, like waking up one night to have my rosary wrapped around my neck, choking me. This event had left ligature marks around my neck. The strange part is that I had slept in a rosary for years, and I had never had anything like this happen. Other strange things that went on were doors opening on their own, the kind of doors that have handles that require twisting to open. The story I'm telling you today centers around this old house. My grandparents decided to sell it, as they were both in their 70s. In 2013, I was alone at home with our housekeeper as I was studying. The real estate agent showed up to the house unannounced. I opened up for her and out stepped an older Muslim woman. With this woman were two little girls dressed in uniforms that matched the Catholic primary school I had attended many years prior. The one girl had the same fair complexion as her mother. The other girl was definitely Indian and not Arabic. I found this kind of strange, but I figured she was probably just a school friend. I welcomed them into the house and they looked around. As the agent and the guests made their way upstairs, the little girl who appeared to be Indian stared at me as her hand trailed along the banister. Then I went to go unlock the other home on the property where my uncle stayed with his family. Right behind me were the two little girls. They rushed into the house and made their way into my cousin's bedroom. The Indian girl was sitting on the bed petting the cat who was fast asleep and the other girl was looking around at some toys in the room. I told the girl on the bed that the cat usually doesn't really like people touching her and that she's lucky. The girl just smiled at me. Finally, the parent and the agent arrived at the flat on the property where we were, so I stepped outside to give them some space. Once they had finished, they thanked me, and the agent, the mother, and the lighter-skinned girl, who I had assumed was her daughter, had stepped outside. I paused for a moment and eventually asked the real estate agent if she could please call the other girl to come outside so that I could lock up. The mother and the agent looked at me, puzzled. What other girl? They asked. The mom said, I only brought my daughter. I laughed at them and told them that I don't really have time to joke around because I really did need to study for my final exams. Their faces fell. I could now see that they were not kidding. I rushed into my cousin's bedroom, only to find it empty, apart from the cat still sound asleep on the bed. I tried to compose myself as I said goodbye to the real estate agent and the prospective buyer. After they left, I asked the housekeeper if she had seen who got out of the car. She responded that it was just two women and a little girl. I know that I did not imagine this, because I clearly saw her. She had thick black hair cut into a bob, and she had a blue Alice band. The way she smiled at me. This experience still haunts me to this day. I don't know if it was an apparition that followed the little girl from school, and maybe knew that I also attended that school. Maybe that's why she showed herself to me. I really don't know. I have never come up with a good explanation for what that was. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, 
because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general, and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow, until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now, since I was the only one in the cabin. I decided to lock the door to my room, just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams and I'm in no rush to see it again. I'm a 30 year old man blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like Boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before, all of it going in through one earbud while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk, and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast, 
and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. Back in 2004 to 2005, I worked in a group home supporting people experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mostly worked nights, and since the clients in that home were pretty chill, we were always allowed to sleep a few hours before getting our clients up and ready for the day. I usually slept on the couch, with my shoes on the floor next to the couch, and my cell phone, keys, etc. either on the table, in my shoe, or next to my shoes. One morning, I got up and started getting things ready for the day. I had left my phone on the floor in front of the couch. I was a few feet away from the couch, looked over, and I saw a hand reach out from under the couch, grab my cell phone, and start to pull it under the couch. I lunged down and grabbed my phone with one hand. I pulled my phone back toward me, but I felt the resistance of whatever had a hold of my phone pulling it away from me under the couch. After a moment of tug of war, I pulled my phone from the grasp of the hand and it disappeared back under the couch. I was really freaked out and even to this day I get chills thinking about or relating this experience. The hand was obviously thin to be able to slide in and out from underneath that couch. From the wrist to the tip of the fingers was maybe three to four inches. The skin on this hand was gray and wrinkled, almost shriveled, and the nails, the fingernails were long, pointed, thick and yellow. I have no idea what it was that tried to take my phone, or why it wanted it, but it creeps me out to this day. I figured I would share my experience living in a 200-year-old cabin that was definitely haunted. So all of these things happened over a span of three years. It started in 2012. A childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. I needed to get out of my parents and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. It dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family that owned the house. They owned a large portion of the land that's now one of the largest cities in the US. Search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a bunch of images that look just like it. We originally think that it was used as slave quarters, as this was tobacco country, and then later found out that it was a stable house later on. The stable house theory definitely checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have it. The night we moved in, I knew the place had something eerie about it. 
there were no doors to the upstairs room, my room, and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that somebody had added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout didn't have either. Now that you have a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start the story. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold, and damp, much like a cellar. Par for the course with that type of house, but there was something else. It started with scratching. Every night that I would be in bed, I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was long and drawn out, like a foot long pull, then repeated. I just covered my head, muffled my ears, and closed my eyes. I was a 23 year old man that felt like I was cowering, but I wasn't about to tussle with wood scratching spirits. Well, one night, I heard the scratching start. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late, and that's when I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room, and then it went down the wall, and then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall, and then gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. Like I said, it was an old log cabin. There were no spaces anywhere for something to crawl, like when you have insulation and stuff like that. I got scared and I started sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was all in the first week, by the way. Here's the creepiest part. When we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut. We had to clean out weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. We had to write, doesn't live here, on the hundreds of mail order catalogs that the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but now I'm not sure if we're too far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room, and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with when somebody was with you. Until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity started to loom over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building up in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprang up from my sleep and I looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off, just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time it was far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I had turned it off myself. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happened in there. Maybe because it was an addition, I don't know. Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid after being married for five years, so that part worked out, I guess. Anyway... Once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window started to open and shut. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny that it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling at it, telling it to leave us alone and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it worked. Kind of, for a while. Then when I was home alone, alarm clocks started going off. As soon as my wife would leave, drawers would open, there would be banging on the front door, 
and these alarm clocks would go off. Over time, it just stopped, slowed down, and ultimately fizzled into nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Who knows? Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords. And the home is cute, homey, and warm. I spend time there alone, and I don't feel any malice. Weird experience. I would do it all over again if I had to, though. Can't argue with results. I didn't believe in ghosts for the first 22 years of my life until I spent three months living in a haunted cabin. I always thought that there was some reasonable explanation for hauntings, and honestly, sometimes I still do. Maybe this wasn't a ghost. Maybe it was some kind of weird gravitational energy messing with things, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My roommate and I, let's call him Derek, moved out to Colorado with meager savings into a small cabin that was pretty much out in the boonies. Our closest neighbors used their cabins as summer homes, so we didn't really have anybody nearby. That's what's cool about living in the mountains, though. There's a sense of total isolation that you won't get anywhere else. You can turn off everything in your living space and hear nothing but the breeze. No highways, no car alarms, nothing. It's very peaceful. But after the first week or two in this cabin, Derek and I began to notice weird things happening. First, there was this eerie feeling that we would get. I remember Derek once joking with me that he didn't like being in the cabin alone because it gave him creepy vibes. There was one back room in particular where if you stood in it at night, you would feel like you were being watched. Sometimes I would come home from work and just have this sense of total dread and unease with no explanation. At the time, I wrote it off as me just being paranoid. You know, hallucinating stuff that isn't there because I wasn't used to the total silence and winter isolation. I started noticing things getting moved around as well. One morning, my car keys would be missing, and I'd frantically search, only to find them in a weird spot, like on top of our refrigerator. I thought Derek was just messing with me, but he kept insisting that it wasn't him. Soon, he started having his stuff get moved too, and he would get really irritated at me, thinking that I was trying to prank him back, even though he hadn't pranked me in the first place. One night, we were sitting around playing video games, when something flew across our field of vision. We both looked at each other for a second, before realizing that we had both seen it. For context, the cabin was a typical A-frame, so for the most part, it was one big room separated into a loft and a downstairs, with the kitchen and our beds at one end, and the living room, TV, wood stove at the other. Whatever small object flew across the room had gone from the kitchen all the way to the front door. We examined it closer and found out that it was a single green bean from our meal that evening. We kind of held it up and looked at it for a second. It had flown all the way across the house, from the stovetop in the back, all the way to our front door. We really didn't have anything to say about it. It was just super weird. The next morning, though, was when I knew our house was haunted. I was watching some TV in the front room, when BAM! The roll of paper towels we had sitting on our kitchen counter flew into the table and knocked a glass of water everywhere. The roll had been thrown with force, to the point where I thought Derek had tried to chuck it at me. I turned around to tell him off, but then I realized he wasn't there. He'd been in the shower the whole time, getting ready for work. I felt a chill go down my spine. Some force, spirit, ghost, whatever, had thrown this thing across the room. Derek didn't believe me when I told him, and I couldn't blame him, but he soon came to his senses. The next couple of months were crazy. 
Everything from car keys to full decks of cards to box cutters would be thrown around our apartment right in front of our eyes. We'd hear weird growling sounds at night that sounded like they were right in the middle of our house. To be fair, sound carries strangely in the mountains, so maybe we were just hearing some nearby animals, but still. One time, my roommate stormed out of the shower, furious. What the heck? He said. Why would you turn the lights out on me in the shower? I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. But by far the most frustrating thing was how our stuff just kept going missing. I mean, it got ridiculous. One night we left our car keys in a very particular spot just to see if they had been moved in the morning. When we woke up, they were gone. But not just that, they had been tucked between the pages of To Kill a Mockingbird on our little bookshelf. It took us hours to find them. Another morning, I could not for the life of me find my phone. We tried calling it, and it would ring, sounding loudly throughout the house, but we couldn't pinpoint the exact spot. Finally, we tracked the ringing to the bathroom, but it sounded like it was coming from behind the wall. The vanity sort of hung there, so I thought, eh, it's probably in the wall seeing how weird everything's been. Maybe there's a hole or something. I took the vanity off its hanging nail, and as soon as I moved it, my phone slid out the back and clattered onto the floor. Derek and I looked at each other, and his face was totally pale. How is that even possible? The haunting got to the point of just being silly. We had a friend come visit, and as soon as she opened the door, my car keys were thrown in her face from across the room. She was like, wait, is the cabin haunted? We kind of joked that, yeah, things get thrown around sometimes and you just have to ignore it. She didn't want to stay there anymore, and that was the point where I asked my landlady if she could provide some history on the cabin we were renting. She got really defensive about it, and said she had owned it for years and nothing weird had ever happened there. Long story short, we got evicted a couple of months later. I don't really want to go into it because it doesn't have anything to do with the story. But yeah, the uneasiness persisted until we moved out. Although in the last month of living there, the ghost chilled out on throwing objects at us. I still don't have a concrete explanation for all of the weird things that happened. But I definitely believe in ghosts and other things that we don't understand. Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82 the one right beside the nature trail at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until we had gotten home. As it turns out, my sister, who was eight at the time, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason to find a tall man standing by the bed, with his arms crossed, and an angry look on his face. At first we thought the figure was my dad, and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear, as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see the man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was, and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, You don't belong here, or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at Cabin C82 is something we reminisce about often. 
but we've always been curious if anyone else has experienced anything similar. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lori, Virginia, and experienced something paranormal, we would love to hear your story. Bonus points if it happened in Cabin C-82. The creepiest thing I've ever seen in the middle of nowhere was in the forest at this place we called the Tar Pits. They were these deep ruts in the ground, maybe three to four feet deep, and they were filled with this purple-green muck that acted a lot like quicksand. It sucked in and consumed whatever had the unfortunate fate of wandering into it. If a small vehicle got stuck in it, it normally took a bulldozer to pull them out, with significant damage to the vehicle in the process. The stuff would rip the bumper right off a vehicle while being pulled out. One summer, we had a brutal drought, and the tar pits dried up. Along the bottom of the holes was a giant pile of bones. Animals that I figure stepped in and couldn't get out. A lot were clearly deer, with some squirrels, possums, and some that could have been foxes or dogs. I haven't been over there in years, and I don't know if it's still like that. But I would love to know what that stuff was. That muck was the weirdest stuff I've ever seen. Probably not paranormal, but still creepy. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home, and I was about 13 years old at the time. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here, besides the odd being-watched feeling that I would always experience in that home. My mom had hired my biological father, who I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at the place. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I won't go into it, but I came to learn that my stepfather had a certain type of addiction that led him to having many women in our home that were not his wife, many of whom were professionals in this trade and were younger than his own 30-year-old children. I found this very concerning for a number of reasons, and there are some other details that, like I said, I won't go into, but let's just say it was evident that this guy had some very serious issues. He really gave me the creeps. I told my mother, and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that I wasn't telling her anything she didn't already know. I wanted to get away from him and everything he was doing, and he bought a vacation home in Western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and I moved down there and I was living on my own. He had most of his items and furniture from his old home in this house that I was staying at alone in Arizona. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers, scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was totally scared after that and I couldn't sleep. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bath as well as the master bedroom and the closet. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that bedroom, and I was frightened to even be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. 
I was sitting in my chair, and I just felt like I was being watched again. I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Then, maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, while still playing my game, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds after the slam, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was frozen in fear. I stood up at my desk and all I could do was let out a scream. I called my mother hysterical and explained to her what had happened. Two days later, she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I found out that she was divorcing my stepdad, sending him to live in the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house, beside that feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of the stairs, growling, frozen still. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state, and I've never experienced anything like that since. I'm still wondering if there are any explanations as to what might have occurred. I believe this might have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lives in. This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that somebody had left the oven on. Each of us denied having done it, but we knew somebody had to have left it on. Looking back though, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody had even put food in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, movements from the side of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting, but myself and one other were not totally convinced. It was soon after that it was only me left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing some studies, they looked up to see a face peering at them before it vanished. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore that she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would just send shivers down our spines any time we were in there. There was one night in particular that really scared me, though. I always locked my door before going to bed, and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself that it was just a dream, and I went back to sleep. 
The next morning, my door was wide open. So were all of the doors in my wardrobe. And the guys had told me that it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night long. I hadn't moved anything. So many other things happened in that house, but this story has gone on long enough. I decided to tell my story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate, and without saying which house I lived in, he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate that a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior because of the activity. When I told him which number it was, he almost fell off his chair. It was the same house. So, my partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally visit him. I live in Scotland and he lives in Arizona. Experience number one. So I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. While we're both interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences. Whereas he tends to just humor me, not believing much of it himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment, but I saw, I heard, and I felt small things the first couple of days I was there. One morning in particular, at about four in the morning, I was on the sofa playing on my phone, jet lag, you know, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to a shadow person phenomenon. It was just dark, humanoid shaped, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned, almost as though it was startled to see somebody else in the room, never mind somebody who could also see it. It did a sort of double take and then disappeared, but the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I have come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy with the exception of later that day, when I was taking a nap. I felt what I thought was my partner standing over me, watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and nobody was there, but I felt that negative presence over me, as though it was trying to work out who I was and why I was there. It was told in very clear terms that it was not welcome, whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine by me. Experience number two. My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome, and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times, once to Jerome and another to a recreation spot by a lake. I felt a little funny any time we were driving around or near the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us traveling through their land. Nothing felt bad, just a sort of curiosity. But one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix, after a day at a lake, we were all chatting away in the car when we got into reservation territory. I got the not alone feeling again, but still it was curious though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation, and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down, when in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know he was a Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anybody else had seen him, they all said no despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, and completely in white, clothes and hair and everything, with an aura of hazy light around him. He simply stood, watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. It was comforting. I don't really know why I'm telling this story, other than the fact that I thought maybe a lighter story would be better to put with a spooky one at the beginning. 
In any case, I hope you enjoyed these stories. And if you've had any similar experiences in Arizona, let me know. In the fall of August 2013, I was set to begin my first semester at Arizona State University in Tempe, and I had to attend an orientation in the middle of campus. After making the 30-minute drive earlier than anticipated, my grandma pulled into the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church where we exchanged conversation for about 15 minutes just to kill time. There was a gardener in front of us tending the flowers, and only one black sedan parked directly next to us that I hadn't noticed earlier when we pulled in. As we unceremoniously prepared to get out of the car, something caught my grandma's eye in her periphery as she reached for her seatbelt button in the direction of my passenger seat. She quickly gasped, placing her right hand on her chest as she chuckled and then quipped, wow, I thought I saw a ghost. Looking directly at her, without turning as she let out another nervous chuckle, I asked her what she was talking about. The parking lot at this point was dead silent, and the gardener was busy tending the flowers in the building opposite of the Methodist Church. Not expecting much, I slowly and nervously turned to my right, where a four-door black sedan was parked to the right of us, only to come in direct eye contact with what seemed to be a woman of Asian heritage with a bob haircut, pinstripe suit business attire, staring at us for no discernible reason. With the dead stare they were giving us, it could be assumed that they had been staring for longer than we had noticed them. What made this individual terrifying was the lack of life in their eyes. I only looked for what felt like five seconds, but I could feel that glassy, uncanny valley, lights are on, but no one's home look. It's one like a corpse might have before their eyes were closed. The color of this entity's skin was a pale color that I could only associate again with a corpse at the time. Their mouth slowly developed into one of the most unsettling half smiles I've ever seen as their dead eyes looked at me and my grandma unwavering. In this deafening silence, similar to a panic attack or a fight or flight feeling, my grandma and I turned back to each other, chuckled uncomfortably, and slowly got out of the car, refusing to look at the terrifying entity or person in the car next to us. While my grandma claims she forgot about this incident, she believes it probably did happen when I bring it up to her. If anyone can help me with identifying this type of entity, or if you've had any experience with something similar, let me know. I know that certain areas of the Tempe campus are haunted. I couldn't find any information on an incident like this, though. In 2013, I worked as a baker in a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It was a super old building and had a reputation for being haunted. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. 
I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks, a tall portable shelving unit. It was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle had managed to get on top of the tarp that I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my coworkers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and I told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other coworker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal stuff and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of a cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words. It had texture to it. I have never heard anything like it before. It was like somebody speaking from another dimension, almost staticky. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me, but after finding no other explanation, I turned around and faced her and said, what was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought that was you. We were both frozen in disbelief. At the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on the top of the espresso bar moving, and we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches into the air, wiggled a little bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and then we ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was just so utterly in awe of what had just happened. I remember saying out loud something like, Okay, I get it. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I have ever witnessed. Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me, so I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention, and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. But things got worse as time went on, and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. 
For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by, all I can say is it was a big man's shadow and this thing was standing at the end of the hall. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood under the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone. Just leave me the F alone. And with that, whatever it was turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day. We found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway, on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed it was about one o'clock in the morning, and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, No doctor, please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere. I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in, because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like for some reason she couldn't trust the doctor or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything, 
I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people, as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother, and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys, so there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it. But of course, my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place, picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars Pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight, and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house, and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them, and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me. But every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself, and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark, and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing, where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry, so we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. 
and I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep, and there was no woman in there, so I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there, so we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks, and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18-month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this, you get home from a stressful day at school and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open, and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops, and the cops came in and did an investigation, all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So, of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I gonna do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon, he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, Upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other. Just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, So did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door. So when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. 
Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so is the kitchen, and the fire, and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening, or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school, so I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed, the fire, the bed breaking, the knocking, the giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more. So I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later, the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs, and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch, and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like, our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway... We looked up the address on a background search for properties, and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliche, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway, that was the haunted house on Ashland Street. 
I've never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. Most people would be thrilled to move out of a haunted house. But for Reddit user Kate the Girl Who Dreams, moving out of her haunted house was different. Here's her story. So my boyfriend and I had been living in this house for a few years. He had gone overseas for a little while and then returned. A few months later, and we started to pack our bags for the move into a new place. When we finished packing up the boxes and clothes, my boyfriend did something I didn't expect him to do. He put his hands together and thanked the ghosts for helping us, and then said his goodbyes before leaving the room. He said he felt sad, and it would have been a lie if I had said I didn't feel the same way. For years, activity in that house had rather frightened him. It upset him as well, and a few times it was so bad that he cursed at them within the room as activity occurred, which is why his last action in that room surprised me. I felt that they had been heavily misunderstood, the spirits or whatever. Throughout the years, they had told me a lot about themselves. I had gathered a lot of EVPs and photos from the house. It was a love-hate relationship with them. At times, they would warn me of somebody around me, I don't really know if it was because I was the only tenant who was constantly there and who actually spoke to and got anything on them. One time I was at work and a customer said that he saw something like a little boy next to me. I started to recall the little boy entity who was in the house I lived in. I did a spirit box session later and I asked if one of them had followed me to work. The little boy's voice actually responded and said, Yes, only me. I get that it was scary for some, but moving away from the haunted house was also something that felt rather saddening and freeing at the same time. It's nice in the new place. The first day and nothing paranormal had happened, a rather quiet night of sleep. It feels nice and yet strange at the same time, oddly lonely, but it's something my boyfriend and I will get used to. The only thing is, my boyfriend brought a piece of jewelry that one of the entities really liked with us, so we'll see how that turns out. But for now, it's quiet and peaceful, bittersweet, but still a nice change from everything that was going on before. Time for newer and better things, a change of scenery. I was around 24 years old at the time of this event. I have always had trouble sleeping, and I would sleep during the day most of the time. This particular day, I woke up way later than usual, and once I did, I was really confused because it was already dark outside. I started wondering what had happened to my mother because she never takes her keys with her. I'm the one who opens the door for her when she gets back from work at the end of the day so I wondered why she wasn't home yet. I was about to grab my phone and call her when I realized some of the lights from our hallway were on. For a second, I thought I was dealing with an intruder or something, but I heard my mom's voice right away. How did she get inside? How come I never heard the door? I got up to make sure it was really her, and it was. When I asked her how she had gotten inside, she got really mad at me, asking if I was crazy and told me that I was the one who had opened the door for her. I asked her how the workday was and went straight back to my room after. I never opened that door. I was sleeping. So who the hell opened it for her? The door was locked from the inside. Yes, I've already considered sleepwalking, but I've never had it, and no one has ever seen me doing it. And I think my mom would have noticed if I was sleepwalking as opposed to just opening the door as usual. To this day, I know that somebody, who apparently looked like me, opened that door. 
but I never did. This story comes to us from Reddit user Pineapple Juice. I believe I've told a story from them before, but here are some more tales from their haunted house. I was about nine when this happened. My mom, my sister, and I moved into this old house that was built before the Second World War. My great uncle, who was a veteran, told us stories about when it was in its glory days. Everybody in our town said the place was haunted. And that just put signals off in my head, especially when I remember driving past the front of the house and seeing a girl in the attic window. I eventually shrugged it off, but I still hated the house. I always felt like I was being watched, and I never felt alone. I was always uncomfortable, and I just hated it. I begged my mom not to move us in, but yeah, that didn't happen. Whether you believe in mediums or not, both of my grandmothers had a hardcore belief that we had medium blood or something like that, but that it skipped a generation. My room was the worst to be in, always freezing, always felt heavy, and always had something weird going on. My sister always hated going past my room to go to the restroom, and I always hated being in my room. When we first moved in, I would knock on the floor and something would knock back. I would grab midnight snacks and see shadow men and women and children out of the corner of my eye. One time, I was even making a sandwich and I saw a shadow man in the hall. I remember that I said hi and then continued making my sandwich. For some reason, I turned and the shadow man was maybe a foot away from me. It took me a moment, but then I ran to my room. Another time, I was sleeping in the living room. I felt a hand press against my back and heard light footsteps. It felt like a man's hand. My parents are divorced and no one had their boyfriend over. Another time, I had a few pieces of paper on the table in the living room. I made a joke that the ghost should move it. A moment passed and then the paper shot across the table and just stopped right on the edge. I jumped up and ran. Another time I woke up in my room and saw a girl in my doorway. And not like skin tone and hair color. She was translucent and gray with gouged out eyes and what I assume was blood going down her face. She had a dress on and a coat. I stayed frozen before I finally jumped up and moved past her. My sister shrugged it off until her boyfriend stayed in my room while I was over at my grandparents' house. He saw the same exact thing, but he shrugged it off until he heard about my story. What made it so much weirder is that what he described is the same girl from the window and the girl that was in my room. There are lots of little stories about this house, but hopefully you enjoyed those. My husband at the time and I had been married about a year when one of his friends told us that they were buying a house. Their rental house would be available and the rent was very reasonable. His wife's parents knew the owner of the house and he was fine with us moving in. We said yes, since we were happy to leave our small apartment. My husband told me that the house was pretty nice. He and his friend's band practiced there all the time. Weird stuff started happening right away. I worked and went to school during the day, while my husband was a working musician, so he was gone until very late. I woke up in bed one night, and I heard the front screen door spring squeak open. Oh, my husband's home, I thought. He put the key in the lock, opened the door, and quietly let the screen door shut. I was still in bed as I heard him walking across the living room, so I called out hello to him 
and told him he doesn't need to be quiet because I'm awake. He didn't answer, so I called out again. The house was quiet. I looked at my cat, who was in bed with me, and she was on high alert, sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring at the bedroom door. I don't know how long we hid out in the bedroom, but some time later the screen opened again, and it was all louder. The door unlocked, and it was my husband this time. These events happened quite a few times, but sometimes it was just footsteps. There were often crashing sounds in the house, like a broom handle hitting the floor. Cabinet doors would be opened, and small appliances would be turned on for no good reason. We started unplugging everything when we weren't using it to avoid this. Guests, and later roommates, also experienced the same things. The house had a reputation with the neighbors, who called it Tragedy House. Once I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and a tall black thing flew from the wall behind me on my left, through the kitchen, and out the outside wall. It happened in just a second, but I remember thinking it had to hit that wall. But it didn't, it just went straight through it. The house's owner, our landlord, told me that his wife had died while they were on vacation years earlier. She fell down some stairs, leaving him with three small children. He said that she loved this house. He would always say, I can still feel her here when I come in. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. In this tale, Reddit user expert maybe 5106 tells an eclectic mix of tales that happened at their haunted house. Here are the stories. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I have so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this story to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the most significant things to take place here over the years. To preface this, I'd like to say that I'm a 21-year-old female, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both of my parents, four cats, and a dog. Now it's just myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she'd passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they are attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell and a calming feel that comes along with her. We also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them, because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits, or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine, if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs, and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist-type activity. That being said, on to some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks me about it. So, one day I was probably around 14. I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in. 
but I also didn't want to just send a black screen. So I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started to struggle to focus. It wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, of course, but I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worst. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest or something come over. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to Wicca. It seemed like BS to me at first, but this man had told me that there are ways that we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but as I understood it, a candle alone equals good, and a candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into that, it can open a portal to darker dimensions. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking that it was BS. But then I remembered just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom, I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle darn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and get rid of it or remove it, whatever I had to do. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take this Wicca stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little bit less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say that I was possessed for a few hours but for me, it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me that I did things that I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house, the same room that I got scratched in. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later, so what I'm telling you from here until I snapped out of it was told to me by witnesses. My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights began to flicker in the bathroom and I just stopped talking and it was like I was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked me what was wrong and I responded with, I can't leave, there's someone blocking the door. Right away she knew something wasn't right and told me to just go out, but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her that she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere, upstairs, main floor, basement, every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, she saw me standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked me where I'd come from and that she'd been looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily that it wasn't even like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom and she said, no, you weren't. I just looked in there. Once she said that, she said that I completely changed and she could tell that it like enraged me or something. I told her that she needed to leave and apparently I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14 year old girl talking to one of her best friends, 
that definitely wasn't like me. She tried to argue over leaving, but apparently, the more she did, the more aggressive I got about telling her to get out. So out of fear, she left, and she and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed, and no one knows what I was up to. But I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered, you know, the portal mirror, with the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared, or stop running, or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe it is this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except that I didn't remember falling asleep, or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we did a little bit more research, and we talked with the Wiccan priest, I ended up finding out that I had an attachment that I created, like I said, with that Ouija board at 11, and then I just strengthened it with the mirror portal. I was blessed and so was the house, and for a long time things were better. My house, though, is still extremely haunted, and I could share a lot more about it. Little things here and there, like hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs, my dog not being willing to go in the basement, hearing voices being touched, objects moving, stuff like that. But this story is about the craziest stuff that's happened to me. This past Halloween, my fiancé and I went to explore a real haunted building. I honestly wasn't expecting to have any weird experiences, and I went in being skeptical. We booked ahead of time, and I think it was a group of about 20 people or so that we didn't know. They gave us the history of the place and the rules, and said to go look around. It wasn't a guided tour at all, it was just kind of a do-your-own thing. The place was super creepy, and I felt like I got weird vibes because of that. However, we went to the second floor, and I was walking past this tiny room that they probably used to store medication. I went to walk into the room, and the mirror in there was broken. I got really lightheaded, and an instant headache when I looked at it. I felt almost like I wasn't myself for about 30 seconds and I walked into another room. As soon as I left, the feelings went away. About five minutes later, my fiancé said that she had the same thing happen to her, before I even told her what happened to me. We ended up standing in a hallway, and I was just recording with my phone. I'd say maybe 15 minutes went by, with nothing. And then I felt this electricity from my feet course through my body to my hands, and it was like an unseen force went to push my phone away. I wish I could have captured an EVP or some video, but I didn't. Has anyone else checked out a haunted place like this and have any experiences? It's definitely one that's going to be on the books for me for a long time. On May 3rd, 2017, my life was pretty similar to how it is now. I'm a bartender in a smallish beach town in Florida, so I know most people who frequent the bars in our downtown area, either as other service industry workers or patrons. I also have always lived within walking distance to work and the strip of bars and restaurants. That being said, I was 23 at the time and constantly hung out with a pretty large group of friends and coworkers and going out almost daily after work. Although this absolutely made no sense from the beginning, I thought for a while that there might be an explanation to what I experienced. If there is, I never got one. And I'm 100% sure that I do not know the person who this mystery item belonged to, but let me back up. I was going through my trunk before a camping trip one day with a guy I was dating, 
who lived in the apartments across the street from mine. As we're clearing things out, we find a large black duffel bag stuffed in the very back of the trunk. Upon opening it, I discovered it was full of various soccer gear. Cleats, socks, safety pads, and a jersey with a name I didn't recognize on it. I had zero recollection of anyone putting anything in my trunk. I don't have any friends who play soccer, and I never have. The name on the jersey is one that I've literally never heard of, even now, and searching on social media didn't yield any results. The guy who I was dating at the time thought that I was lying, and thought that it was from another guy I was hanging out with, or had hung out with and dated in the past. He didn't believe me that I had no idea how it got there, who the person whose name was on the jersey was, and didn't hang out with anyone who played soccer. That drove me even more insane, because I literally didn't even discover the bag in the trunk on my own previously. This was the first time I had ever seen it. I asked every person that I was around regularly as well, as well as pretty much anyone I'd seen in the past month. No one had any clue what I was talking about, or recognized the name on the jersey. Please note that there are no spare keys for my car, and I never let anyone drive my car. I always keep it obsessively locked, and my car has never been broken into. I ended up throwing the bag away a couple of years afterwards. I kept it in my trunk forever, hoping that the mystery would solve itself eventually, but no. This will forever drive me nuts. To this day, I have no idea who that person is, or how that stuff got into my trunk. This occurred about three years ago. I had a position as a buyer, and as such, would receive tons of cold calls and emails from people trying to get our company to try their products for resale. Also important, our company had a digital phone system, like VoIP. There was one central number, and it followed a phone tree to multiple offices via internet connection. Voicemails were available on our big office phones, but the recording would also be sent to our emails. So one day, I received a voicemail from a phone number I recognized as someone who had been attempting to get a hold of me, to sell me their products. Oddly, the voicemail was something like 15 minutes long. Curious, I began to listen to it. The message begins with just static, and the sound of rustling. Seems like a classic butt dial, or maybe they forgot to hang up when the voicemail clicked on. I fast-forwarded the message, just to see if anything was ever heard. And yes. Suddenly a clear voice. They're having a one-sided conversation. I think, ooh, these can be fun sometimes. Except, the one-sided conversation is clearly with me. The person on the phone is referencing my then-recent maternity leave, our company by name, a few other pretty identifying details that currently escape me. They'd stop speaking, and it would be blank air, and then they would answer a pertinent question that I would have asked in that kind of a conversation, clearly speaking to me, but I never spoke to this company or this person. I did receive additional emails from them later that were clearly initial attempts at communication, and not a follow-up conversation. I checked with coworkers in case somehow, somewhere, their conversation got picked up in my voicemail, and nope. Co-workers and husband were equally confused, but with zero explanation, we all just had to move on. I was about 15 years old when this happened. It happened in school, which was in Ireland. In my school, we had compulsory subjects that we had to take, such as math, English, etc. We were able to pick two option subjects. I chose technology, kind of like woodworking but with circuits as well, and art. My best friend of like 12 years and I got put into the same technology class. Now, to be honest, all we ever did in that class was mess around. We never completed our projects and instead we would just burn stuff and do stupid things. 
Anyway, each table was square, and one person was sat at each edge, and beside each person, connected to the desk, was a mechanical vice. It's basically something that you could tighten to hold something in place. My friend and I would literally put anything in there and just squish the crap out of it. One day, we had a piece of copper wire. It was quite thick, I'd like to say a centimeter in width, and it was probably like eight or nine centimeters long. We placed it in the vise and started twisting the knob and tightening it on the wire. When the vise fully closed, we opened it to see what would have happened to the wire. However, when we opened it, it was gone, and I mean like fully vanished. We started to look under the table, in the vise, around other tables, even behind our teacher's desk. After looking everywhere, we thought maybe we dropped it and somebody picked it up. We had like eight others in our class, so we just asked them if they had picked up a copper wire. And of course they replied, no, didn't you just squish it? Or no, I didn't see anything. Now, I want to emphasize that my friend and I spent at least an hour looking for this wire, and we tested another wire in the vise to see if that would vanish but instead it just fell on the floor when the vice was opened. We just laughed it off and said that it's probably some kind of interdimensional thing, but we've really been puzzled about what happened ever since. In 2004, I went to Ireland on the super cheap during this one magical week where there were insanely low fares. That's not the glitch, I'm just nostalgic for that time. While visiting family there, I picked up a Ross O'Carroll Kelly book, not realizing that it was a popular series, and read The Orange Mocha Frappuccino Years in about a day. The first person narrator uses a Brett Easton Ellis-like voice, where everything is his impressions in real time. I found it hilarious. At one point, we were walking down Grafton Street in Dublin. We walked past a busker and he was playing Don't Look Back in Anger, and he was right on the So Sally Can Wait etc part as we walked by. Something about how he was singing his heart out, even though it's sort of a cheesy song, impressed me. And I turned to my partner and said, you know, I don't care what anyone else says, I love this song. And she said, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I heard another one doing it earlier. I had been with her, but I hadn't noticed. Later, in a train station news agents, we were selecting supper. It was either a triangle sandwich each or a candy bar each. And another book in the Ross O'Carroll Kelly series, The Teenage Dirtbag Years, to read on the next train. We chose candy and the book. She'd read two pages, then I'd read two, passing it back and forth, perfect for a late evening train where half the people were sleeping and the rest were quiet. She handed me the book with an odd expression at one point, and I looked down to read. It said, So I'm walking down Grafton Street with Sorsha, and we walk past this busker, and he's doing Don't Look Back in Anger, giving it all, so Sally can wait. And I turn to Sorsha, and I say, I don't care what anyone says, that's a great song. And she says, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. My own skepticism says, okay, common street, common buskers, and if you google the title of the song and busker and Grafton, there's a YouTube video of a guy playing that song in 2014. So it is a cliché. And our conversation wasn't at all original, filled with phrases that are really just filler in a way but it still felt really eerie. And honestly, it kind of still does. Back in May of 2012, my family and I went to Ireland. We were staying in a cottage in a rural area that was far away from any major city or town. Two days before we were leaving, my cousin and I and her two-year-old daughter, Maisie, were outside in the garden. 
Maisie had one of those interactive books for young kids that play nursery rhymes. Row your boat, hickory dickory, things like that, whenever you pressed a certain button. She was messing around, pressing multiple buttons, when she pressed a green one that was supposed to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it didn't. Instead, the book played a song that neither I nor her mother recognized. Even weirder, however, was the fact that Maisie began to sing one line toward the end of the song, which I remember being something like, I will reach the Golden City to join the Angel Band. Her mother, of course, was shocked, as she was only two years old and was just beginning to talk. These words were extremely advanced for her vocabulary, even if she had only learned from memory. When I got home, I searched the lyrics Maisie had sung, and it turned out to be what I had speculated, a hymn, specifically one called The Pilgrim's Journey. None of our family was religious, and neither of us understood where Maisie had learnt the hymn, and even less why the book had played it in the first place. We tried pressing the green button again and again, but it never played the hymn again, just Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, as it was supposed to. Reading some posts about Glitch in the Matrix experiences reminded me of an experience my mom had about ten years ago. I asked her about it again tonight, and she retold it to me to make sure I had all the right details, so I'm telling the story on her behalf. My mom was driving into the city one day and was stuck in traffic. We live in Ireland. She was looking out the window at the buildings and saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair in the doorway of one of the buildings. She described this woman as a shawley, which apparently was the name of the women in this part of the city in the 1940s and 50s who worked in the marketplace. They were called shawleys because of the black shawls they wore. She remembers the woman looking out onto the road with a solemn expression, and my mom was particularly fascinated by her because it had been so many years since she had seen one of these women. The traffic moved on and she parked in a car park around the corner from the street. About an hour later, she was leaving the city and looked over to the side of the street as she was passing to see if the woman was still there. All of the buildings were run down and boarded up, including the doorway the woman had been standing in. She said that the buildings looked entirely different to how she had seen them just an hour before. My mom has always thought of this as sort of a seeing through the veil type of thing. But could it be a glitch in the Matrix after all? A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear, all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail, near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. 
It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the OZ bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and I'm still at least two miles from civilization. And that civilization, in reality, was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, 
I heard music, more specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life, no birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods, certain places have it, but this was different somehow, unique to this place, unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, Without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses, and Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, It's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other, and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago, maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, Your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. 
It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then it cut off. I'm going to preface this by saying that it isn't my story, but something that happened to my parents. They live in western New York, upstate, and they're very open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens, for reasons other than this encounter. That's a story for another day, though. It might be a good time to add that my parents do not use substances or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory cognizance and intuition goes. I'm just going to copy and paste the text message that my mom sent me about this experience. I thought somebody would find it interesting or maybe even have an explanation for them. This is what my mom had to say. Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a UFO or something between Randolph and Steenberg. There was a huge, very bright light blinking off and on in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except that it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that's not a falling star. I even thought it might be a plane, but it was too bright and too fast and it was plummeting downward with intention. Then all of a sudden, mid sky, it was just gone. I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or the trees. Right then I said, did you see that? And at the same time, dad said, what the heck was that? He said that he was thinking the same thing I was. And at the same time, we both noticed out loud there are no mountains. And there weren't. No mountains, no hills, no trees. It was just cornfields and open space. And this thing just blinked out of existence. The next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky. And it shot directly upward, back into the sky. I was looking out of my rear view, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad turned around watching it, and it started to follow us. We had that same eerie feeling that we did when we saw that thing that we thought was Bigfoot. All we kept saying was, what the heck is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. Isn't that weird? This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. That feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, 
catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like Pix or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2 Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools, but when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably 10 screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. My boyfriend and I went to visit family in New York, and we stayed at the Hyatt Grand Central. I believe that there's a paranormal world due to having experiences in my childhood home. I also know that Grand Central Station is known to be haunted. Our hotel was connected to the station, but I didn't think anything of it. Of course, ghosts can't travel from building to building, or so I thought. It was our last night, and I was asleep. I woke up to the sound of the hotel doorknob moving, as if somebody was trying to come in, but I never heard the door open. I closed my eyes and said to myself, you're just imagining things. I heard it again, and I looked up. When you walk into this room, there's this long walkway, and the bed is to the right. I looked up and I swear to Jesus and all of his disciples that I saw a man, a tall figure with black eyes, peek around the corner. I screamed, somebody's in here. As soon as I screamed, he disappeared and I heard the doorknob again, as if he had walked out. My boyfriend jumps out of bed butt naked and runs around the room. The door was locked, so I don't believe it was an actual person, because hotel doors are heavy, and you can usually hear when somebody opens and closes them. Of course, you can't lock the door behind yourself. 
I only heard the doorknob move, but never heard the door, so we figured it was a spirit. I later found out that there are tunnels from the hotel to the train station, and many people have died in the tunnels. Beautiful hotel, but I will not be returning. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch after those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds, and then a loud bang came then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door. It was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth, while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between, because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly, and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment, I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer. Another cliche thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal, except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, the night of the event, 
there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that, but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us, because I had been living there for about three years, and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus, I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. But why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving, and it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much. The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. Personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on, so why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt along with my mother have had many unexplained experiences and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. from California, and way back when I was on the college search, I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop. So my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old rundown overlook of the falls. 
This overlook was down a hill and through some trees, so my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, you who." I kid you not, when I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yuhu, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. A while back, the night before the last full moon, I went outside past midnight. It was pretty dead quiet outside, especially since it was during a big cold snap. I was out for fresh air when I heard the sound of chains and ice crackling in the near distance. I got a creepy vibe, but I tried to ignore it. There were no cars or people out that I could hear or see. Suddenly, I heard and saw my backyard gate creak open. I felt this intense presence as I heard footsteps quickly approach me. I ran inside and closed the door before it got to me. I couldn't see anything, but I did get a picture in my mind of a being with 
antlers or horns or something. Not clear enough to say for sure. But it felt like it was speaking to me telepathically. I could tell that it read heavy energies. And it told me, don't carry their burdens. And that my heart was lighter than I believed. To keep it pure and I'd have nothing to worry about. I asked it about how to heal or let go of these pains and frustrations that I'd been having with trying to move on and let go of an ex-toxic friend. They told me that they didn't do that kind of work and left. I got the feeling that they did heavier work. It didn't seem to have any harmful intent. There was a wisdom to it, but not something or someone that I would want to cross paths with if I were up to no good. I live in central Canada, if that helps. The prairies. I can't seem to find anything specific online about any deities or entities that match. There's Krampus, but I feel like I highly doubt that that was it. It was way past Christmas. And I don't think it's tied to Canada at all either. The words mentioning my heart being lighter than I believed made me think of Anubis but I still don't think that it was Anubis either. I'm not really sure what I encountered that night, but it was really fascinating. It all happened during November of 2017 I had just graduated and decided to sign up for the school's annual graduation trip to Johor and Singapore. At the time, my friends and I subscribed to very dumb content on YouTube, such as the 3am challenges. I can't believe I used to think that that was legit. When we arrived at the hotel at 10pm, my friends and I that were assigned to the same room decided to push through the fatigue and stay up until midnight to go explore the floor, or in other words, go ghost hunting. The hotel had already sketched me out when I saw the ancient looking lobby and had witnessed the hotel workers warning us not to use the lifts. We had to climb to the 15th floor. Before the trip, we already knew that this establishment had a dark history of side cover-ups. For example, we heard rumors of an unaliving on the 13th floor that caused a whole entire room to be sealed up. It's midnight, and my other friend and I decided to split up to explore both pathways of the current floor. We wanted to go hang out in the lobby, but unfortunately it was pitch black down there. Unsurprisingly, we saw nothing and proceeded back to our room for bedtime. At 4am, I had a strong urge to pee and I was shivering so badly from the cold so I got up to relieve myself, and right when I finished up, I began to go back to sleep when I hear three clear knocks on the front door. I know this was dumb, but I opened the door without looking through the peephole. I swear that if it was somebody with malicious intent and not some kind of paranormal thing, that would have turned out pretty badly. As expected, I didn't see anybody though, so I just coerced myself back to sleep. I told myself that I was tired and I was probably still half dreaming. Turns out I was wrong. As I turned back, it started again, but this time I did look through the peephole because my common sense started to return. Again, nothing. I retraced my steps back to the bed and I tucked myself in while preparing mentally to just ignore the knocks. Another three knocks happened when I rested my head on the pillow. This time, I chose to not even give it a thought. The opposite happened. The knocks became louder and faster. Then they started to become bangs. It was at that moment that I knew that whatever I'd been hunting had started to play with its food. I tried waking up my friends, but to no avail. They managed to continue sleeping while I was slapping and shaking them, while something was trying to get into the room. I finally gained the courage and grabbed a chair nearby. I proceeded to stand guard in front of the door. 
I would go on to pray while getting tormented by whatever was outside, until I finally passed out at around 6 a.m. The next morning, the whole squad was asking if I had sleepwalked. I tried explaining to them what had happened, but nobody believed me. This really irritated me for like half the day, until my friends from another room called us over that night to game. That night scarred me for life. This was the night that we potentially saw a real-life possessed person. The teachers didn't allow us to travel between rooms to meet our friends, so we had to sneak over there. While sneaking, we saw a woman wearing a pink color baju karong without the tudung on, on the 13th floor. We saw her when we looked down into the lobby. Her face was obscured by the floor's ceiling. She was ramming her whole body onto a random door, and she was levitating. And before we went sneaking, the class group chat had messages regarding students seeing feet floating past the bottom of their room's front doors. Before we realized that she was levitating, we thought it was just some drunk person, but soon started questioning why she would even be drinking alcohol in the first place given the culture. We started recording the situation after about three minutes of whatever that thing was banging the door, but she would burst into a sprint and dashed her way toward the lift lobby on the floor, which is a blind spot. We patiently waited until it decided to reappear. But before that, two Malay women walked past the lift lobby and headed straight to the room that the thing had been banging on. Halfway to the room, the thing in pink starts walking again instead of levitating behind them and follows them right into the room. After that, we tried running back to our room, but we realized it was locked from the inside. So we spent the night over in the room we'd snuck over to. I still remember the panic that my parents had when I texted them about it. They told me to delete the footage and kept asking me if I did the room entering ritual correctly. To this day, I'm still tempted to return to that hotel, but my gut is telling me not to. Was it ghosts? Mold? Our imaginations? I guess I'll never know. I am a 23-year-old female, and my husband is a 23-year-old male, and recently we moved in with some roommates. They are James, male 26, Danielle, female 25, and their young daughter Sarah. We went from living in a decent-sized city to living in the middle of nowhere, about an hour away. For context, we live in the south of the U.S., so it's a rural, woodsy nowhere. We're really good friends with our roommates, and husband and I knew beforehand that they had both experienced some paranormal goings-on before we made the decision to move in. To be honest, I think husband and I forgot all about the paranormal stuff just before we moved. Everything was great when we were settling. We all got along really well, and it was so amazing to be in a place where we had our own space and were on equal ground with our roomies. Then one night, about a month later, husband, James, and I are all lounging in the living room area. Sarah was asleep in her room, as it was late. We're talking about the paranormal. Around 11.30 p.m., James has to go pick up Danielle from work. She works the late shift, about a half an hour away from us. As James is getting ready to leave, he mentions skinwalkers. Now, husband and I don't use this word. For those of you who don't know, speaking aloud the word skinwalker or wendigo is sometimes believed to attract these deadly creatures to you. Husband and I had strange and horrifying experiences at the last place we lived after one of us made the mistake of saying it aloud. So we don't say it anymore. Our code word for it is flesh pedestrian, if you're curious. As soon as James said it, I gasped. He laughed it off, but right before he left, he noticed something through the blinds on the back door of the house. He mentioned that he thought there was somebody in the backyard. 
In truth, we don't really have a backyard. The back of the house is right up against the edge of the woods, but we just call it the backyard. Husband and I, thinking that he's messing with us, laugh it off. Quickly, though, we can see from James's face that he is not. We rush to look through the blinds, and sure as heck, there's something in the trees. It was incredibly hard to see, but it was a very, very tall and thin figure, darting quickly between the trees. It kept itself completely shrouded in the black shadows, and we couldn't make out any other features. James rushes outside, thinking that it's somebody on the property. Husband and I follow, not wanting him to be alone. I stay on the porch while husband rushes down the steps to follow James as he goes behind the house. The second he leaves my eyesight, James immediately turns around and shakes his head at husband. He tells us that as soon as he got to the edge of the trees, he heard a low voice saying, turn around. I come from a pagan background. My mother is Wiccan and my husband is also pagan. As James leaves, the husband and I finish our cigarettes. I immediately set out to bless the entire house with sacred oils and blessed salts. I had already done this as soon as we had unpacked the last of our things, but I felt it necessary to do again. I went so far as to bless the entire porch as well. As husband and I are doing this, James texts me that he doesn't feel safe and that something isn't right. When I ask him what he means, he writes that just a few miles up the road, a naked man came charging out of the woods and stopped at the edge of the road. When he locked eyes with James, he simply pointed at the car and kept doing so until he was no longer visible in the rearview mirror. We tried to rationalize that it could be one of many non-paranormal scenarios. We thought it might be a prank, but that didn't quite make sense. It was the beginning of a very cold winter, and it was only about 20 degrees out. It would have been a lot of effort and discomfort for this man to pull a prank like this on passing drivers. Then we wondered if the man needed help or was possibly in danger. But James was sure that this man did not look at all like he was in distress. If he was, the man would have yelled or tried flagging down the car instead of just pointing at it. The conclusion we came to, for the time being, was that he was most likely on some substances. We don't live in the safest of places, and hard substances are very common around here. Then James texted that he had picked up Danielle, and more weird things were happening. I asked him to elaborate, but he said that he would explain it all when they both got home. As their car pulled up in the driveway, husband and I went outside to meet them but the two of them quickly got out of the car and rushed toward the house, telling us that we all needed to get inside immediately. When inside, James explained that right before he got to Danielle's place of work, he saw something in a cow field that he can't explain. It was tall, taller than any human could possibly be, and much taller than the thing that we had already seen behind the house. From what he could tell in the dark, it was gray, and it was running, running faster than he was driving at 60 miles per hour, on all fours. And then it ran into the woods out of sight. When he was driving back with Danielle, before James could explain everything that had already happened, she got a sinking feeling in her gut and made James lock all the car doors. A literal second after James complied, the same creature he had just seen was once again sprinting alongside the car. It was much closer to the road than it had just been minutes before, but it dashed again into the trees before they could get a really good look at it. We were all a bit shaken. It was now close to 1 a.m. and none of us could explain anything that had already happened. We tried to brush it all off and we probably could have if it was just one thing that had transpired instead of several. We made the awful decision to go back outside for a smoke. The kind of decision that only idiots in horror movies would make, I know. And that's when things got really weird. Off to our right, there's a small strip of woods, 
that separates our property from our landlord's property, where he lives with his daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughters. In those trees, we notice three sets of eyes. They're glowing yellow-green, and they're just staring at us. Husband asks James if it could be deer, as we do tend to see a lot of those around, but we all knew that whatever those eyes belonged to were far taller than deer could be. Then, to our left, there's more, you guessed it, woods. From that direction, in the pitch dark, I swear I heard a little girl laugh. It wasn't boisterous or loud, more like the snicker that a child makes when they're trying to suppress their laughter. Danielle and husband didn't hear it, but James did. Now we're looking at the big tree to our left that stands just before the edge of the woods, and notice that there's this big black mass behind it, as though something was crouched next to the tree. We all try to rationalize that it's just a big bundle of leaves, but I don't think any of us really believed that. James and husband both dart back inside for a moment, and when they come back out, James is holding a hatchet, and husband is holding his crossbow. Without saying anything to Danielle or I, they step off the porch and walk toward our left, where the little girl laughed. Later, they told us that they thought a child was in trouble and they wanted to help. While Danielle and I were on the porch, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, we see something a few yards away. Down the driveway, there's a huge tree in the middle of the property. Out of our peripheral, we swore that we saw something duck from behind the tree. We kept looking at the tree, and yes, there was something poking its head up from behind the trunk, pulling back very quickly as soon as it realized we were staring at it. At this point, Danielle and I wanted to get inside. We're both shivering from fear and cold, and we just wanted this night to be over. But while Danielle and I were in a match of paranormal peekaboo, husband and James had their own very weird experience. For context, I have Tourette's syndrome. This means that I say and do things completely out of my control, and some of my verbal tics are just strange sounds. Some of those sounds include blowing raspberries or popping my lips, which are my two most common verbal tics at the moment. As James and husband are inching closer to the trees, they both hear footsteps through the grass and leaves within the trees. Both of them were too frightened to call out to whoever they thought was in there. Then they hear shuffling. The problem is though, they each hear shuffling coming from different directions that the other doesn't hear. James was walking to the left, husband to the right. James hears shuffling coming from the right, but husband doesn't hear it. But husband hears it coming from the left and James doesn't hear it. So they turn toward each other with their weapons drawn. In their confusion, while they're facing each other, they hear someone running in the woods, full on sprinting through the trees, heading directly toward them. And then it just stops. They take a step back and watch to see if anybody comes out of the woods. No one. But then they hear something in the woods. They hear me in the woods right in front of them. They heard both of my verbal tics. But the problem was, I was standing on the porch behind them. Without turning around, husband calls to me and asks if I just had a tick. I told him no. They back away from the woods without taking their eyes off of that spot until they're close enough to sprint into the house, pulling Danielle and I with them. Inside, Danielle and I are able to tell them about the thing behind the tree, and James and husband are able to tell us about how something mimicked my tics to a T. For the rest of the night, we didn't go back outside. We would all, against our better judgment, peek through the blinds out the back door when we passed it. There was still something in the woods every single time that one of us looked. I didn't get any sleep. Come morning time, husband and I checked all the places that we had seen or heard something, and there was no sign of anyone or anything. 
I asked my mother what she thought it might be. In her opinion, it was likely something related to a mimic spirit. A spirit that warps reality to feed on fear, but not having enough power to really hurt anybody. She said that it couldn't be a skinwalker because there were too many things happening in too many different places all at once. Skinwalkers are solitary and territorial things, so it couldn't have been multiple of them. But just one mimic could do all the things we experienced. We still hear the occasional giggle in the dark, get a bang or a knock at our back door. We still even see the thing behind the big tree in the driveway almost every night. But that night was something else. I've seen some things in my life, but never, never have I gone through about three hours of nonstop activity. I've since burned sage all throughout the house and the entire perimeter of the property, as well as using the rest of my salt and oil around the entire house. Husband and I even did a late night EVP session at all of the spots that things had happened that night, but we didn't get a single response to any of our questions. I don't know for sure if it was a mimic spirit or if I can fully rule out a skinwalker. I don't even really know if the thing was dangerous or not. But one thing's for sure, I will never forget that night. So, I'm a pretty skeptical person when it comes to the paranormal, albeit having a vested interest in the tales and evidence. I'm the kind of person who browses ghost hunter videos on YouTube and stories on Reddit. I've also visited plenty of purportedly haunted locations in the US, including but not limited to places like the Omni Parker House, the Molly Brown House, the Whaley House, Alcatraz at Night, the Winchester House more than once, and none of them have yielded any sort of evidence. A part of me wants to believe, but is also terrified at the prospect of witnessing something. I was mostly a non-believer, up until a couple of months ago. In short, I had wanted to plan a surprise party and getaway for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She had mentioned wanting to hit the slopes. It was January, so it was still winter time at this point. I organized this months ahead and had invited some of her closest friends to join. I ended up renting an Airbnb cabin that had enough rooms to house 10 people or five couples. One entire lower floor basement level with two beds, a room on the first floor and three rooms upstairs. Also adding that this cabin was in a beautiful rural neighborhood in Tahoe, California with tons of cabins next door, down the street, adjacent, etc. So there's plenty of housing around us. Nothing peculiar about it. And there are other people staying around. Of course, my girlfriend and I take the master bedroom upstairs, and right across the hall is another couple in one room, and my girlfriend's cousin by herself in the third room next door. All rooms are taken, and the middle floor is a lively area with games, a fireplace, and a foosball table. These details are somewhat relevant and important later in the story. The first night was a night of merry drinking and games. To celebrate the occasion, we had decorated the living area and blown up balloons to be loosely strewn about the large and cozy living room and the family room where we imbibed. It was almost uneventful with respect to weird happenings, except toward the end of the night, balloons would randomly pop at odd intervals. Someone in our group suggested that it was the balloons getting attracted toward the heater vents and popping. I was dismissive of this because not all of them that popped were congregated near vents. I just took note. I didn't want to argue or suggest anything weird at this point. After we all retired for the night, and all the lights were off. We could hear balloons popping downstairs at random intervals that reverberated through the silent house. This happened between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. The next morning, there were still plenty of healthy balloons strewn about. Fast forward to night two. After we returned from snow activities, we prepped for drinking and the usual. 
After a full day's worth of shredding the snow, we're all collectively tired a bit earlier than the previous night, and we decide to retire around 11.30 to midnight. Here's where I personally experienced things that got me feeling irked. Since it was cold, I decided to go downstairs to turn on the thermostat or heater. Our couple friends across the hall had their door slightly open ajar. The lights were on and the bathroom was in use. As I'm going downstairs in the dark stairwell, I hear the floorboards behind me creak. I figure it was my friend coming out to follow me for a cup of water or to go to the kitchen. As I walk across the living room and stop at the thermostat, the lights are still off at this point and the creaks continue. And then I hear it stop a few feet behind me near the kitchen. The kitchen lights don't turn on and I hear nothing else. Feeling like he was waiting behind me and I was being watched, I said, what's up dude, need something? I turn around and nobody is there. I've only ever read about this dreadful feeling of being watched, and it is indeed every bit as dreadful upon realization in person. A minute ago, I swore someone followed me down. I was taken aback, and my skeptical self once again took note and spoke nothing of it. I went back upstairs. About 30 minutes pass and it's still cold. At this point, everyone is asleep and I decide to turn up the thermostat a couple of notches. Nothing crazy. I turn on the upstairs hallway light bright enough to light the steps and see from downstairs. I proceeded to head downstairs and stop once again at the thermostat. No floorboard creaks except for my own this time. As I'm turning up the thermostat and thinking to myself how odd that creaking was the first time, a noise broke my train of thought. I hear the ball from the foosball table, several feet away near the fireplace, audibly roll across its surface and hit one of the side walls. Nobody is around, and I am certainly too far away to touch it. I froze in fear and hastily went back upstairs. Somehow I went back to sleep, not even knowing how to mentally process the increasingly evident occurrences. I eventually fall asleep under the pretense that nothing is definitive enough for me to be conclusively sure that this cabin is haunted. I don't mention or wake anyone up about my experiences. The next morning as we leave and drive back home, the balloons were brought up by my girlfriend's friend and couple who stayed across the hall. I took this as an opening to talk about my experiences and I disclosed them. At this point, my girlfriend's friend goes pale gets really serious and tells us that the previous night she was still wide awake when she noticed a dark figure standing at the foot of her bed. She states that she went into panic mode after blinking and realizing that it wasn't a dream or a hallucination. She shook her boyfriend awake, the guy that I thought had followed me down the stairs earlier that night, only to have it disappear when he woke up. This, by far, coupled with my experiences, is undeniable evidence. I myself was wide-eyed upon hearing this solid piece of information. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the room next to us, then mentions that she heard what sounded like breathing in her room, but dismissed it as naturally occurring sounds of the walls of the cabin. These events, standalone, could be nominal and may be explained, but collectively, it's really hard to deny that something was present and amiss. I'm hoping that this is the extent of my run-ins with the paranormal, because I don't want to experience anything like this again. The universe has made this skeptic more of a believer. My boyfriend and I absolutely adore hiking, and there are many places to go because we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11 p.m. at night to one of the most used trails in our area. 
We had both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire path, it was actually very clean and stable. We started walking up the trail when we started talking about paranormal things. I know it was probably a terrible move on our side to talk about that sort of thing at night in the middle of the forest, but anyway. Now it is to be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones, and we were both being very observant as to where we were on the path. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we weren't on a trail anymore, or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail, and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking. But thankfully, he said no, because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. I truly believe if we had tried to backtrack, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill when thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down, terrified, and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. It was a really strange experience and I don't really have any explanation. I just know in my gut that it's a really good thing we didn't turn around. This took place in Poland, probably in January. It happened about six months ago. I just had a chat with my friend and I recalled the memory. During winter, I used to go on these short hikes to my local forest. Most of the time, nothing out of the ordinary happened. The most unusual thing was seeing a wolf pack once and that's it. But this event happened at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. The weather was quite cold, about negative 10 degrees Celsius, and snow was lightly falling. There were no people out that day. One hour into the woods, I heard it. This weird music, which seemed to come from all directions at once, and it kept getting louder. It sounded like muffled piano, and something resembling jingles could be heard too. It went on for a solid minute, and then slowly faded away. I was so weirded out that I didn't even take my phone out at first, but when I finally did, I realized that my phone had turned off, probably because of the temperature. After the music stopped, I decided to finish my hike anyway, as I found it more in the category of weird than frightening. The other strange thing though is that when I go out hiking, I always see deer, wild boars, hares, and other animals. There was not a single living being to be seen after I saw the music. What could it have been? 